Yes, Teresita Baralt, B A R A L T. T E R E S I T A. Mrs. Baralt, <coughs> are you the sister of Jose Menendez and the sister in law of Kitty Menendez? Yes, I am. And we have a family tree up here. And can you find yourself on the family tree? Right here. And your husband's name is Carlos? Yes. And you have four daughters, Sylvia, Christina, Alicia, and Anna Maria? Yes. No age. Oh, sorry about that. And Jose was your brother, is that correct? Yes, he was. Younger or older? I'm the oldest. He was the youngest. And Marta is it's your It's the middle one, yes. This is Burrell? Yes. Were you born in Cuba? Yes, I was. And was your brother Jose born in Cuba as well? Yes, all three of us were. Marta as well? Mm hmm And when did you come here from Cuba? November 1960. And when did your brother Jose come here? October the 7th, 1960. And when he came here, were you and he living in close proximity to each other? <coughs> When he came over, he came with my, my husband-to-be at the time. Okay, I was still in Cuba. And uh, he lived in uh, Hazleton, Pennsylvania with Carlos and his family. I lived in Illinois with Carlos's parents. And we were not married. So okay. Okay. <laughs> at what point in time did you begin to live close to your brother Jose? Okay, I came in three days before my wedding, which was June 24th, 1961. Jose came to live with us first week in July. And he lived with us until January that he went to Southern Illinois to school. And over the period from 1960 till August of 1989, a period of almost mm -hmm. 29 years, what period of time did you live either in the same house or within 15 minutes of him? 14 and a half years. And did you see him and his family on a regular basis? Very often. When, if you look up at the, uh, up at the chart up there, okay. you will see that uh, we have a, variety, a, a number of the houses, homes that they lived in listed. Did you live near them when they lived in Wexford Terrace? in New York? No, we were at the time in Evansville, Indiana. What about when they lived in Cedar Grove, New Jersey? They moved there because we were living there. So you lived near them then? Uh, around a mile. What about at the uh, Hinsdale home in Illinois? We lived across the street and we moved there because they were living there. Okay. And when they lived in Muncie, New York, did you live nearby? No, we had stayed in, Illi in uh, Hinsdale, Illinois, and uh, they moved to Muncie. When they moved, when we were transferred back to Princeton, they sold their house in Muncie and they came to live in Princeton. During the period of time they were living in Muncie, New York, did you ever visit them at their house? Very much so. Very often, yes. How often would you visit them? Well, we spent Christmas together. I would come to the East Coast because my parents were also here. And uh, summertime, I would make sure that the children came. We would stay mainly with my parents who lived in New Jersey. And, uh, but saw them daily. I would come for maybe three weeks and then I always tried to bring the children in the middle of the winter to see our grandparents. Did so. you spend holidays together, birthdays, Easter? Thanksgiving? Other you mean during like all those years? During the years they were in Muncie? Yes, we tried, we tried to do Christmas and Thanksgiving for sure. Okay. And then we, we took a vacation to Hilton Head for a week. We've, we'd like to vacation together, so we did that often. 
Now, when they moved into the Princeton Junction House, were, were you living nearby? I was living at the time in Hopewell, and we had chosen two lots in the Princeton Junction area. Uh, they, it didn't materialize because they didn't get the, the builders didn't get the ordinance. And uh, at that time, I had started my children uh, at the high school there. I had high school kids. Their kids were small. And uh, then we bought two lots, one across the street from each other on the house, the other house, not the Princeton Junction, but the Pennington house. But I couldn't. I had high school kids. You don't move them around. Okay. So we bought a house in the West Windsor area and stay there. So that's only 15 minutes away. Okay. When they lived in the Prin Princeton Junction, are you a little nervous? I'm very nervous. Okay. <laughs> okay. When you lived in the Prince, when they lived in the Princeton yes. Junction house, did you live nearby them? Yes, around 10 minutes. Okay. And when they lived in the Pennington house, how far away did you live? Reverse. They moved to where we were coming from. Okay. So it was around 10, 15 minutes away. And when they brought, bought the Mountain Avenue home that's still in the same area, I take it? So you were still closer. Close? It was closer than to our house. And in 1986, when they moved to California, you remained in New Jersey. We, we're still in the same place. We've lived in that house for 15 years. When you, um, when you were living in the Hinsdale house, mm -hmm. did, um, were, were, the, uh, were Lyle and Eric born at that point in time? Oh, yes. Um, Lyle was around three, and Eric was born. They moved there in November of 1970. Uh, Eric was born in November of 1970. They moved two weeks after Eric was born. Uh, we joined them the following summer. And by that time, I think Lyle was three, and Eric was uh, seven or eight months by the time we moved there. And were you uh, in touch with the Menendez family during the time that they were first in Hinsdale before you moved there in terms of how, how the kids were doing, what was going on with them? Did you talk on the phone? We talked often. How often? Once, once a day, once a week, once a month? Probably once a week. Uh, during that time until, you know, Carlos went to work with Jose in Hinsdale. I mean, yeah, in that area, in the Chicago area, and uh, we moved there. Were you getting reports about Lyle's progress as a baby? Yes. And did there seem to be a lot of family pride in his doing things early? Lal was a very fast baby. He stood up at five by himself. He walked at seven or eight months. Uh, everything he did, he rode his bike by three and a half, no training wheels. I mean, this kid was coordinated, to say the least. Okay. And were you getting reports regularly about his progress? Oh, yes. And did it seem to be the well, they were very proud of him, and they had reason to be. Okay. Uh, Your Next in order. Mm -hmm. 201. Showing you what, you've marked, what I've marked as 201. Do you recognize that photograph? I hadn't seen it before, but I recognize the baby. Okay, who's the baby? Ah, uh, Lyle. Okay. And were you given photographs that sort of marked his progress along those lines in terms of when he stood up and that type of thing? I wasn't given the photographs, but I certainly did see them. showing you what I've previously marked as 150. I'll ask you to look at that photograph and see if you recognize it. Find one of my glasses. <coughs> yeah. Uh, this is Lyle and the steps in his house. His house where? Hinsdale. And is there another house in the photograph? Yeah, that's my home. Okay, so he's standing in front of his house, which you can't see. Is that correct? You can see his home, but I recognize the steps. Okay, and you can see your home? No. 
Well, I can see them at the back of my home, yes. Okay. And was there something unusual that happened on a regular basis with regard to Eric and going to your home? Well, Eric would wake up early in the morning, still in his diapers, get out of the house, and go and bang on my back door. She's right here. Uh, I would open the door, and there would be Eric. A year and a half, less, with his diapers halfway down his legs. So I would call Kitty and I said, Kitty, Eric is here. Ter impossible, Eric is in bed. I said, well, go check, because I have somebody else's child here. Day in, day out. How many times do you think this happened? Gosh, I don't know. It was a habit by then. Uh, do you think it happened 20 times? 15? 15, you know, yeah, sometime, somewhere around there. And did it cause you any concern because he had to cross the street to get to you? Objection irrelevant. Sister. Did you um, ever discuss with Kitty the fact that this might be dangerous if this child is crossing the street? We did discuss it. And. Did she uh, be concerned? That can cause speculation. Sister. Did she indicate that she was concerned about this? Well, I think it was more embarrassment of the fact that a one and a half year old could just walk out of the house without her knowing about it. I mean, it happens once, but so often. What year were Kitty and Jose married? 1963. I was around them not that often, because when they married, they went to New York, and I was living in Evansville, Indiana, and I had three little ones to take care of. So I saw them, at the time I didn't have three little ones, I had two, and another one on the way. But uh, I saw them, like I said, I always went in February for around three weeks to my parents. So I saw them there. I saw them we for Christmas, the holidays. Did you witness fights between them? Yes. Did you have an opportunity to see Kitty's temper? Yes. Did she have a bad temper? Kitty had a temper. Did you ever see her physically strike her husband? While he was driving a car, was sitting in. Yes. Now, did she just reach over and tap him? Or well. They were having an argument, and she was very exasperated, and she just started hitting him. And, and uh, yeah, that was a, a normal reaction for Kitty, just to close her fist and just get very upset. And so he drove with the left hand while he held her hands with the right, and then she calmed down. Did you but ever see her strike him on any other occasion? No, no. That was the only time in front of me. Jose was two years younger. He was only 19 when they married. And when did he graduate? He worked full time and went to school at night. And I think he graduated in 19, either 65 or 66. So when La was born in 1968, he would have been working full time and not going to school. Is that correct? Yes, he was out of school already. Where was he working? I think he was Libran, Cooper's and Libran. He was, uh, one of his degrees was in accounting. He had two, he graduated with two degrees. And um, he needed three years in an accounting firm in order for his CPA to come through. He had taken the exam, he had passed it, but you, had, you, you have to pay your dues. And um, so he had worked there like three years as an accountant. Auditing, I think, is what he was doing. Okay, so at the time, I think so. I think so. I think so. Like to mark next in order, Your Honor, 202. 202. Ask if you recognize this photograph.
By the way, this is not my house. Okay, which is your house? It's over here. Oh, all right. See the difference? So this is your house in this yes. photograph with the bicycle. This is why I looked at it and I, okay. Perhaps you this can identify fine. the photograph she was pointing to as not being her house. Okay. Photograph number 150, her house is to the right of the house. To the right of that one. Okay, the photograph okay. shows a house that's not your house. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Yours is to the right of it. Yeah, mine is to the right. Okay, and the photograph with, the, with Lyle on the bicycle? Exactly. Shows your house. Exactly. See, I am sorry. That's all right. My house would be directly this way. Okay. 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 This is Lyle. He's, what, four? At the most. And he's on a uh, two-wheel bicycle yeah. with no training wheels? I don't remember ever seeing Lyle on training wheels. So he started out on a two-wheeler with no training wheels? Yes. Yeah. And next in order would be 203, Your Honor. Okay. Can you identify that for me? Yes, I recognize the chair. This was taken at my mother's house. You recognize the uh, chair? That's Lyle and Eric. That's a baby. This must have been before they went to, um, they moved to uh, Illinois, when Eric was born. When they were little, very little, when Eric was first born, um, did they seem to have a good relationship? Or did Eric and Lyle? Yes. Did there seem to be some jealousy? No. Uh, I would say it was a very typical rela relationship of a uh, three-year difference between siblings. And what do you mean by that? Um, I think Lyle was a little jealous of Eric, especially of the attention that Eric was getting from his mom. Did Eric get more attention from his mother than Lyle got from his mother? There was no question. Pardon me. Sorry. Time, like what time for it? All right. Um, objections sustained. You can rephrase the question. When Eric was born, did they seem to have a good relationship? Mm -hmm. Or did there seem to be some jealousy? Mm -hmm. Or did they seem to have a good relationship? And while Lyle was very young, did you see some, what appeared to be jealousy? Between the children. Yes. Yes. Okay. And why did that appear to be? Objection to relevant cause of Sustained. <coughs> did you see a difference in the amount of attention that Kitty gave Eric versus the amount of attention that she gave Lyle? Objection to time. The same time period, Your Honor. Yes. Kitty, whether she was more prepared to be for motherhood when Eric was born, there was a difference. There was a difference. Uh, I think Kitty had a rapport with Eric. Kitty never had a rapport with Lyle. I know that sounds awful, but that's the way I saw it. And as the boys grew older in their mm -hmm. teenage years, did you still see the same jealousy or did the relationship no. change? No. Um, they became very good friends. Um, I don't know whether it was... Okay, I think you've answered the question. I'm sorry, sir. I'm sorry. That's okay. okay. Your next question, please. You had told us about the um, incident of, or the repeated incidents of Eric cr crossing the street to your house. Yes. Was there, um, was there an attitude demonstrated by Kitty that uh, her kids should be fearless? And as a result, she did not protect them as much as you thought she might have. Objection, found meaning. Sustained. Was Kitty a protective mother? No. And were you aware of some instances in which the children were exposed to situations you considered to be dangerous? Yes, but that was Kitty's theory. What was Kitty's theory? We discussed that many times. Uh, she thought I was very over, overprotective. She thought that children, when you leave them alone, they learn to defend themselves. And that it's on an everyday situation. Was there an incident in which you were having a uh, conversation with her uh, shortly after Lyle had had some surgery as a young child? 
No, I didn't have the, uh, what he. Uh, what well, do you mean by that? Let me Specify go back. that. Okay. Yeah. Did, Sorry for that. did Lyle Menendez have surgery as a young child for yes. a hernia? For a hernia, right here on the stomach. Okay. Yes. And did you have a conversation with Kitty right after he had the hernia operation? Yes. And was she letting Lyle do something you thought was dangerous? Well, Kitty related this story to me. Okay. She said. That Excuse me, Honor, I'm the being okay. Was okay. this going on? At, was she relating the story to you as the event was taking place? After it took place. Okay. And was it regarding something that she was that Lyle had? She had just permitted Lyle to do what you thought was dangerous. Yes. Okay. And could you tell us what that was? Same objection, Honor. Objection sustained. It's hearsay. Okay. I'd like to show you what I've now marked as two or three, Your Honor. I think we have 203. Is this a new uh, exhibit? Okay, it'll be 204. Do you recognize the boy and the dog? Yes, that's Lyle. And who's the dog? I don't know which one of the Airedales this one is. I don't know whether this is Ken or George. Okay, was there an incident involving Lyle and a dog named, an Airedale named George? Uh, yes, he beat Lyle on the sheep. Okay, now was, did this, was this dog known to be a, a good dog for kids to be around? No. Sustain the answer stricken. Were people careful about not letting small children around George? We have some foundation, uh, at the very least, as to who the owner of the dog was. Did kitties, who owned George? Kitty's father. Small children supposed to be permitted around George? No. Why not? Because they raised the Airedales. They themselves, the ones that they had, were raised to protect them. He, they had a summer camp in Canada. And at night, and I'm telling you because I was there with my kids, and after 9 o'clock you couldn't leave the cottage because the dogs would be allowed loose in the camp. And this is what's their protection. So these Airedales were raised so that anything make them snap. They were used to adults and certain adults. I mean, you just didn't get close to them. And did Kitty let Lyle get close to them in spite of that warning? Brought them to the house. George came as the family pet. Well, it didn't last long. He has a scar to prove it. That the scar on his right cheek? Mm-hmm. Did that happen when he was three years old? He was three. The dog was bigger than he was. And did they then take a relative of George as a pet? <sighs> Ken. Yes. And was Ken of the similar disposition? Oh, yes. Um, All right, you've answered the question. Uh, yeah. Wait for another one. Was this do a dog you would let your children be around? My kids were terrified of Ken. And was that Lyle's dog, that was the dog he was expected to play with? That was the family pet. And was, was this a, sort of a source of pride with Kitty that uh, her son could be around this dangerous dog? <coughs> Sustain. Did Kitty ever uh, try to keep her children from being around this dog who was dangerous? No. Was the dog eventually destroyed? Well, when they moved to Muncie, the dog went with them. The dog mauled to death, a little dog that somebody was walking on a leash, and uh, attacked a couple of people. So they gave the dog to somebody who owned a farm, and eventually the dog had to be put to sleep. There's been some testimony about private talks that Kitty had with Lyle Did you house during the years in which Lyle was in college? Yes. And where would this place? Well, Jose would, uh, Jose did not like to reprimand his kids in public. Where would and uh, he, to the basement. The basement is an office in my house. Okay. And so it would be private? Yes. 
some uh, discussion about the fact that Jose had notes and Lyle didn't, and this was the subject of some concern? Lyle. We have a foundation as to who is speaking when you say a discussion. Did Lyle say something about having gone into that meeting with his father without notes? Yes. Lyle said to me, he says, would you believe that came to talk to me all prepared, notes and all. Yes. Objection overruled on that ground. I think he fell at a disadvantage. After the family moved to the West Coast in 1986, Lyle remained back in New Jersey. Is that correct? Yes. And did he spend a great deal of time at your house? Lyle lived in my house 90% of the time. He had room and board at the university, but he liked staying in my house. I think Kitty was bothered by it. I don't think Jose was as bothered. Uh, I think Kitty was bothered by it. He, she kept on saying he has room and board paid at the university. Why does he stay there? Um, she was very possessive of her children, and I think she felt. Okay. All right, uh, there has been an objection, so the objection is sustained. The answer is stricken. You can re ask the question. Thank you. Was Kitty possessive of her children? Yes. And did she seem to prevent anybody getting close to them? It calls for a conclusion of speculation on the foundation. Sustained. During the time that the family was living on the West Coast and Lyle was living in New Jersey, would Kitty ever call and see how Lyle was doing? Overall. Yes, uh, between, okay, Kitty called me every single day, around 4 o'clock California time, 7 o'clock. The reason this is so much in my mind is because it was dinner time for us. And, um, okay, you've answered the question. Did this happen, in fact, every day? Yes. And uh, what was the purpose of the call? Gather information about Lyle. Jose called once, uh, maybe twice a week, around, but his call was at 2 o'clock. So he also called once or twice a week and asked me about Lyle, what he was doing. Exactly. exactly. Did they seem to ask a, a lot of questions, detailed questions about... Jose right? didn't. But Kitty did? Kitty did. And in addition to these phone calls, did uh, Jose and Kitty ever come back to visit? Very often. How, what's very often? Okay, Jose would be in probably once or twice a month. And uh, Kitty normally came with him. And uh, would they bring Eric along? No. So er Eric was left home by himself. After um, Kitty and Jose died, Lyle spent a lot of money. Is that correct? Yes. Lyle spent a lot of money before they died? Lyle always spent a lot of money. And what did he spend money on? Anything. Um, we have a definition as to time frame here. Okay. Say, from the time that um, he was a teenager, was he spending money as a teenager, buying things? Yes. Uh, Lyle is a generous kid. I, if you're a friend, He'll buy you the world, or give it to you. And uh, yes, his friends always had all kinds of things. Lyle bought me this, Lyle bought me that, and if they went to a restaurant, Lyle paid. Did he have a, a credit card? I imagine he did. I'm not, that I wasn't, uh, I knew he had a signature on his pa parents' uh, account with a $6,000 credit line, okay. which he used. And did he have a, did he seem to have access to a checking account? That was a checking account, yes. Okay. And uh, was it a sort of a topic of family conversation, the fact that Lala always spent a lot of money? Mm -hmm. Sustained. 
Did you ever have any discussions with uh, his mother or father about the fact that he always spent a lot of yes. money? Yes. Did Kitty like to go shopping? Sustain. Did you ever go shopping with Kitty? Yes. And did you go shopping with her at times when the children were brought along? Yes. And when Kitty would go shopping, did she like to spend a lot of money also? Or buy a lot of things? Yes. K Kitty was, I don't know what the word would be, but uh, somebody who, compulsive buyer, okay. Now, on any of these instances when you went shopping, did you take along Eric and Lyle when they were young? Yes, I did. And were there any situations in which Kitty was paged while you were shopping? Only once. Okay. What happened? And, uh, well, she didn't hurry. I mean, at least she knew where they were. Well, that, what w to me, that was... Did the boys disappear? Well, the boys went in, and this was everybody take off in their different directions, and uh, she went shopping. And then when they were paged, that she knew where they were. Okay, so she got paged, your children, Mrs. Menendez, your children are at the information booth, they're at security or something like that? There was one instance when we couldn't find Lyle. And we found Lyle in a shop down the block on an ice cream place, eating an ice cream. Well, the owner figured that parent would come at some point. He had kept the kid there feeding him ice cream. It was quite a bill. <laughs> the time when she was paged, um, how old was he when he was down the street eating ice cream? Young, four or five. <laughs> Not much older than that. Um, the time when uh, she gets paged in the shopping mall. Yeah. How old are the kids? I don't remember. They were young. I mean, you don't page a parent unless the child is very young. And when she was paged, how did she react? Now we know where they are. She continues shopping? Yes. Was Kitty Menendez good with animals? Kitty was wonderful with animals. Was she caring? She was caring. She loved them. Was she gentle? Very. Was she kind? Yes, and seemed to understand them. Did I she mean, amazing. Did you ever see her show to her children the same kind of compassion you saw her show to animals? No, she was, uh, it was very strange because uh, she was a different person with the animals. In what way? She really cared for the animals, okay? It's like kids don't need it, but the animals do. It's like somebody who is an animal lover, you know, and not necessarily a kid person. The I have some other photographs I'd like to show you. Okay. <coughs> <coughs> I'd like to mark these. Um, hmm. Four photographs I've now marked as 205 through 208 mm -hmm. and ask you if you recognize the people and the house. Okay. This picture. First, do you recognize the house? I think the house, you know, Because of the people who are also in the house, this is the, um, the Hinsdale house. And I will tell you why. My brother-in-law lived down the block 
Okay. From us, okay? The children. No, this is not the Muncie house. This is a the this is a Muncie house. Okay. This is this a Muncie, Muncie house. New York. Yeah, because these are the curtains that she had in the Muncie okay. house. And yeah. This is 205. They're all photographs of the same location. Yeah. And do you see Lyle and Eric in there? Yes. There's Lyle and there's Eric. Okay. And showing you the other pictures which we've marked as 206, yeah. 207, and 208, do they appear to all be taken the same day because everybody's wearing the same clothes? Yes, and it appears to be somewhere around Easter time. And does it appear that Eric has some sort of injury to his face? Yes. Do you have any sp I have no idea how he got it. Memory of was it unusual to uh, to have him have an injury? It had to have been a very fresh one because Eric healed in 24 hours. Did Eric get a lot of injuries? No, I only recall one he had over the eyebrow in a store. And uh, obviously that one, but I don't remember that one. And there was no discussion about it in particular that stands out in your mind? No. That day? Uh, no big deal would have been made of it anyway. Why? Well, because Kitty considered that part of growing up. Getting injuries? Yeah, it's scrape like that. It's okay. Was it important to Kitty that her children not show fear? Very much so. Was there an incident in which Eric was left home alone and called you? Well, Eric was left home alone often. The day that he called me, it was a storm, and they lost power. About how old was he? Around eight. And what happened when he called you? Well, he called, and my oldest one, she, he must have been, yeah, around eight and a half, because she was 17 and just starting to drive. She went over and was stayed with him. Was he frightened? He was very frightened. And uh, so y your oldest one is Sylvia? Sylvia. Okay, so Sylvia went over and stayed with him. And did you uh, have any dis discussion with Kitty about that? Kitty was very upset. Why? She was very angry because um, she felt he should have handled the situation. He, you just, Kitty didn't understand fear, didn't accept it from the boys. It was not, you just, you're not afraid. I mean, simply, was regardless that, of the age. Was that true that was her also, she was not afraid? She wasn't, no. Did Eric ever call you again when he was alone, home alone oh, no. and frightened? He knew better. <coughs> was there an incident at a uh, theme park where Eric was not brave enough to go on a ride? Well, it wasn't a, even a ride. We went, it was, um, we had gone, they were around six, and I have one that is three months younger than Eric. And uh, we had taken Lyle, Eric, and Anna Maria to the um, amusement park. And there was, it, it's like you go into this tent, and there's all kinds of, um, it's like a trampoline, but not really a trampoline. The only thing is that you lose your balance, and uh, that was part of the fun. Well. Eric didn't like that, didn't like it at all. He refused to go in. Kitty was fit to be tied because a little girl had gone in and he wouldn't. And how did she show that she was fit to be tied? Well, we heard about it all the way to the car. What was she saying? I don't see what you have to be afraid of. Look, even a little girl goes in. Why should it? She just didn't accept it. I mean, that's all there is to it. How did Eric look during all this? Oh, I think Eric wanted to die. He cried. <laughs> he cried but did not go in. <laughs> he stood his ground.
Did your brother have to raise his voice to let people know he was displeased with them? No. Jose did not need to raise his voice or be violent for that matter. Was there something about his voice or his presence that could be very effective without yelling? An adult is always an impressive figure on a child. An adult that whose the tone of voice and the body language tells a kid exactly, you know, where they, what they should be afraid of. He could be harsh. He could, uh, he could say the things in a way that make you feel like you want to disappear. I saw him do it to a lot of people. He never did it to me. Would, he do, I saw it, him would, would he do it to adults? Oh, easily. He could put an adult back in its place that that person wants to die. Yes, he had that ability. He was very articulate and he didn't raise his voice. In fact, the younger he got, the lower his voice got and the slower he spoke by the time he finished with you. Did you call it once a cut you to shreds tone of voice? Yes, and I used to tell him. Did you ever say to your brother or to Kitty, uh, I don't approve of how you're raising your children. I think you should change some things. I didn't tell him to change it. We discussed raising kids. We did not agree. Uh, at the time, neither point was proven. They couldn't prove that I was wrong. I couldn't pro prove that they were wrong. What would have happened if you really pushed the issue about they should do things differently? Objection calls for speculation. Sustained. Did you ever push the issue? No. I, Why? Well, because when you live either close to friends or family, the first thing you have to have is respect for their ways. I did not see them being abusive to the children. They just saw their ways of parenting to be completely different from mine. But that, those were their kids. Maybe their ways would have been better. It wasn't proven so. In terms of the, their type of parenting, you're talking about the, the fearlessness, the exposure to danger. Is there also a, com a competition factor that was different? There was a lot of pressure in that household. Okay, there was a lot of pressure to excel. Um, whatever you did, you have to be the best at it. Trying was not good enough. And uh, to grow up, with that amount of pressure is very hard on children. They also had, their schedule was such that there was no time to go outside and play. Every minute of their day was accounted for, and always intensely. Um, Wait for another question. I'm sorry. <laughs> Did you see a change in the relationship between Kitty and Jose after they moved to California? I thought it was the California air. They looked like honeymooners, and I had no idea what it was. We all talked about it. He was extremely gentle with her, like when you are afraid to say anything, his tone of voice, his way. I thought California did it. He didn't move. Did you help uh, Lyle clean out his room at the dorm in Princeton in June of 1989? <laughs> I most certainly did. And was your mother helping you as well? My mother and I had to go and pack him. He had that day to get out. He was also catching a flight back to California. And he had it was the end of the school year, so my mother and I went over and organized that Lyle was. Everything was everywhere. So we helped pack. Yes. Do you know who Donovan Goudreau is? Oh, yes. And how is it that you know Donovan? Well, he was a close friend of Lyle's for a while, and they lived in my house. 
Did you get to know Donovan pretty well? Yes. Did he appear to be Lyle's closest friend? At the time, he was. Did you get to know someone else named Glenn Stevens? Yes. And was Glenn a close friend of Lyle's? Glenn liked to think so. Uh, I don't think he was. Okay. was he I think he was just somebody who was there with a group of close friends, but not Lyle's close friend, no. When you were cleaning out the dorm room, did you come across anything that belonged to Donovan Boudreau? His driver's license. And did you come across anything else that belonged he to him? He had, there were a lot of papers in there, and I showed them to Lyle, and I said, Lyle, this is Donovan's driver's license. And uh, he said, yeah, Aunt Terry, when he left, he left all his things behind, all his important papers behind. And were these in a drawer? Or they were somewhere? on the floor, like with everything else. And uh, I said, well, do you want me to take it? He says, no, I'll give it to him at some point. And he took all that. Did you see any other papers of Donovan's that were there? There were a bunch of papers that were Donovan's. I just didn't go and look into it. No. Okay. Did they see, appear to be set aside for safekeeping in any way? They were on the floor. Objection overruled. Your answer was what? On the floor. Um, during the time that you knew Glenn Stevens, uh, did you know him to be wearing a Rolex watch which had been given to him by Lyle? He was not given a Rolex watch. He was asked to hold the Rolex watch. I asked him for it. He said, Lyle told me to save it for him because it may come as evidence in the future. This was when Lyle was apprehended. And I said, uh, Glenn, I think that you should leave the watch here. And, and, he he re and after that, we tried. Did he ever give it back? No, he did not. They didn't even return our calls. When Jose would be visiting at your house, would he get calls from Kitty? Especially when they were in California, yes. How often would she call him when he was there visiting? Overall. Okay, if he was there, he would arrive there. He, Jose normally stayed at the Nassau Inn on campus to be closer to Lyle. And uh, he, the, if he would come and stay in my house like a couple of hours, two, three hours, Kitty would call at least, at least three or four times in, that, in those two hours. During the period of time that you knew him, was there some concern on her part with regard to his fidelity? During the time that I knew them? Yes. Yes. But she had that concern since the moment she married. She was paranoid about Jose ever having an affair. And was there a time in early 1980 in which she moved out because of that? Yes. And where did she and her children go? No, the children didn't go anywhere. The children stayed home. So she just left? She left. She moved to a hotel. And they subsequently got back together, I take it? Yes. Did you know anything about what um, Kitty Menendez's travel plans were in August of 1989? Travel plans? Yes. Was she going to go anywhere? Well, they went to the Nationals on the beginning of August. Is that in Michigan? Ah, uh, Kalamazoo. Michigan, right. isn't it? Yeah. I think. Um, then I know that September the 9th, she was going to be in Princeton to help Lyle set up his apartment in Princeton. I know that she had to be back by the 24th of September because she had to set Eric up in college. And the 14th of, uh, of October, we were going to Hawaii together, the four of us. Did she ever talk to you about any plans to go to South America? Not to me. Did you talk to her every day? During that time, I talked to her. Um, she had, I had gone to Chicago in um, the beginning of August, and I had, I had three messages from her in the hotel. We never connected. We did after she came back from uh, Kalamazoo. And uh, 
No. She, yeah, I talked to her a few times, mainly because we were setting up the fact that she was coming over to set up Lyle's um, condo and uh, thinking about what kind of furniture, etc. So yes, we did talk about it. Now, was this a new condominium that Mr. and Mrs. Menendez were buying for Lyle? Yes. And it was to be ready for him to move into early September? Well, the closing was supposed to have been September 4th. Okay. When was, was, were they in escrow in it then during the summer in August when you were talking to her about her plans? Okay. Lyle was going back to Princeton, okay, and in July, oh, in July, Do I answer? Do I wait? <laughs> Why don't you wait so given any instructions with regard to having a key to that condo? Yes. And what, what were you to do with the key to the condo? Well, Kitty and I had a discussion on that, and I told her she was placing me in a very, very difficult position. What did Kitty want you to do? She yeah, wanted me to... Me. Sorry. You wish to be I'll do the foundation if I can, Your Honor. Did Kitty express to you some concern over a girlfriend that Lyle had at that time? Jamie, yes. And did she like or dislike her? She didn't like Jamie. And did she want you to do something to make sure that Jamie did not spend time at the condominium? She wanted me to get a spare key to the apartment, which probably I would have had. But what she wanted me to do is to go in and check and make sure that she was not living there. And what if she found out that, uh, what if you found out that she was living there? Were you to report that? Did she tell you what to do if yes. you found out? What did she tell she you? She wanted to know immediately. It was a two-bedroom suite, okay? One of the bedrooms was going to be for them whenever they came into the Princeton area. But she wanted to make sure that Jamie was not there. Did you refuse to do that? Well, I told her she was placing me in a very, very uncomfortable position, mainly because I was very close to Lyle, and uh, I felt like a traitor. And so we, she said, well, we'll discuss that at some other time. But with Kitty, it was very hard to say no to Kitty. Why? Because Kitty didn't accept no for an answer. And uh, whenever you stuck to your ground, that means there was going to be a problem. I mean, she just didn't accept a no for an answer. Was she controlled by her husband? In those last years, okay. last three to five years that you were around them, did it appear that Jose had total control over Kitty? The world liked to think so. That was not so. She just learned to be very good in public. Like she, there were no more open fights. She just stay quiet, but not in private because when private, private meant many times we were there, Carlos and I. And she held her ground. Was she strong? Oh, Kitty had an opinion. There's no question about it. Was there any issue with regard to Kitty's drinking toward the end, the last three to five years? That was always kept from me. I did not know that she had a drinking problem. Did you ever see her drink around you and ask you not to let Jose know? <laughs> okay. When, whenever she, they came to the East Coast, she would come over to our house early and stay the afternoon and Jose will come after work around seven o'clock. So we would sit where I'll fix dinner and we would have a cup of coffee. Her cup of coffee always included half a cup of Galliano. Is that a liqueur? I, I don't know what that is. It's a big bottle. 
But I mean, so, so like a wine and liqueur type. And uh, she enjoyed that. When Jose came, she says, put it away. He doesn't like it when I drink. But I assume, and this is my assumption, that... Oh, pardon me, I think... Okay. Uh, the next question. The next question, please. Um, did Lyle spend time at your home even um, as a little child? You said he did in college. Did he spend time at your home as a little child? Sometimes, but always with the family. Except when they lived across the street and he used to come often. Um, did you get to have time alone with Eric? Not as much. Not as much. Uh, they moved to California when Eric was around 13 or 14. And at that time, a child doesn't drive. And when, uh, when you would see Lyle, would he ever spend the night at your house? Sometimes they did. They both did. I used to give them one of the girls' bedrooms, be, uh, beds with the two beds. And uh, many times they would come back at 2 o'clock in the morning whenever we got back. And they would, Jose would carry both boys asleep to the car. So they didn't spend the night really very often? Not very often. Uh, did Lyle have any stuffed animals he'd bring with him? Lyle had a bed stuffed animals. There was no space for Lyle in the bed. Did they seem to be important to him? Very much so. Thank you. I have nothing for you. Okay. Any examination on behalf of Eric Menendez? Yes, Your Honor, just a few minutes. All right, let's do it now. Okay. Uh, actually, I could use a few minutes if I can be heard. All right. All right, I believe we have everybody here now. You may. Conduct your examination of the witness. Mr. Stroll, I want to turn your attention back to Hinsdale, Illinois. Okay. Um, Hinsdale, Illinois, is a small town in Illinois. Yes. Um, and there's a photograph here. so that you can see it and so that the gold jury can see it. Okay. Um, okay, this photograph here, this shows the street that separates the lot behind your house mm -hmm. from the Menendez house, correct? Yes, correct. So you describe now a pattern of behavior uh, by Eric Menendez when he was about 18 months old, where he would show up at your back door. Mm-hmm. About yes. What time of day would he show up? Between a quarter to seven and seven o'clock in the morning. And in order to get to the back door of your house that's shown in that photograph from his house, um, he'd have to cross, first of all, that grassy vacant lot. Right? He had to get out of his crib. Has to get out of his crib and out of his room. Yes. And is this a two-story house that the mm -hmm. is? It was a split level. And is his room up a level or on All the bedrooms are on the top floor. So he has to get out of his <coughs> crib and he's got to go down some stairs, correct? Exactly. And he has to get out a door that leads to the outside. The front door. And was your understanding he was leaving through the front door? Front, so through the front door, yes. And then he had to go down. Was the house raised above ground level? No. We'll try to okay. find it. There, you, you see the steps here? He would get out of the house. You're pointing to a picture on the right. right here. Let me get okay. a number so that the right. The door would be facing this way, so he would get out, and he wouldn't use, he wouldn't use that. He would go straight down the lawn, cross the street, and go straight. Okay, this is 150. Let's see if I can do this so that Julius can see. So there's a set. Of the, the the door actually there's like a enclosed glass enclosed front. The whole house was a very modern house, and it was all glass. Um, you could see, I mean, glass all the way up. It was like a two-story entryway, is that correct? Exactly. Okay, exactly. and it was like a, a vestibule with a, with a glass wall, and that would yes. lead to the, that was the front door. That was the front door. And the opening to the vestibule <coughs> led to these steps. Yeah, exactly. So the, the, at a year and a half, Eric would walk out and down those steps and, and across the lawn? Uh, across the lawn over here, straight into my house. There would be a path by then that he had made 
Well, the path would be in this grassy vacant lot. Right? Exactly. But to get from the lawn or the steps of his house to that vacant lot, he had to cross the street. Oh, yeah, that street over there. And that's a street on which uh, the cars would go to get to the houses in that development, right? Uh, yes. Now, it was your uh, habit and custom, I take it, when Eric would show up at your door to call back to your brother's house. Yes. To let them know that the baby was at your house. Exactly. And would this behavior of Eric's occur uh, during the winter as well as other times of year? Well, it occurs mainly in the spring, but remember the spring in Illinois is cold. Can, uh, yes. And when, when Eric would show up at your door, he'd be wearing a diaper that was slipped down? Uh, well, he would be out of bed. Babies wake up. At the time, the diapers were not like they are now, fancy and tight. I mean... They slipped. They slipped. And he was wearing, I take it, no shoes? Oh, no shoes. And just a, a shirt. Just like a little uh, undershirt top? Either undershirt or a pajama top or anything like that. Would, would there be days when... when when he showed up at your door, he was wet and muddy from the lot? If it had rained the day before, yes. Or if it was raining, I mean... He'd come they, in the rain? Yes. And when you would call your brother's house, oh, most often was it your sister-in-law who answered the phone? Kitty was who answered, and Kitty was mainly who came. You would tell her that Eric was at your house, she'd say, no, he's in his crib. She would say, Terry, it's a quarter to seven. Eric is sleeping. I said, then I have somebody else's child here. And did she seem embarrassed when she would come and pick him up? More frustrated. Frustrated? Yes. Would she uh, say anything to Eric? <laughs> it's limited what you can say to an 18-month-old, you know, like, Eric, you shouldn't leave the house without telling mommy. Went in one ear, out the other. Okay, so she would give this little lecture to him, and, and yet he'd show up again at your house? Yeah, next day. And in fact, you said at some point a path was beaten through the grass. Yes. Yes? Uh, yes. Uh -huh. Now, you said that um, Kitty Menendez treated Eric as a baby and toddler differently than she had treated Lyle. Is that correct? <sighs> that was my observation, yes. Okay. Uh, tell me what kinds of signs of physical affection you saw between Kitty Menendez and Eric when Eric was an infant or a toddler. Okay, Eric was extremely attached to his mother, okay, and um, Kitty was not an affectionate person with the kids. But she would have kind of a, you know when you look at somebody, a child condescendingly? Okay, that was the relationship. That relationship wasn't there with Lyle at all. Okay, so you saw, let me see if I understand it, you saw Kitty Menendez give condescending looks to Eric when he was a baby. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, she... Is that what you saw? Yeah, uh, if that's the right word to describe somebody who just... Okay. Uh, but you didn't even see her give condescending looks to Lyle when Lyle was a baby. I wasn't around Lyle as much that first year of his life, okay? But um, the rapport between her and Lyle was never there. Nothing was there? No, that's why he had it with me. You find it somewhere else. Okay, but let me back up to w between her and Eric. You didn't see her hug Eric, did you? I don't remember seeing it, no. You didn't see her kiss Eric? I don't remember seeing it. You didn't see her carrying him around and hugging him and rocking him and singing to him, doing any of those things, did you? No, but you know, Kitty was not an affectionate person. I understand, but I want the jurors to understand what you did see and what you didn't see, okay? So, yeah. so what you saw was Eric clung to her, is, th is that right? Yes. He went to her a lot. Eric was very attached to his mother, yes. And when Lyle was a little toddler, you didn't see him go to Kitty at all. Now, when Eric was before his second birthday, we'll strike that. Okay. At around the time that Eric was two, did uh, Jose and Kitty Menendez leave Hinsdale and move to Muncie, New York? Yes, they did. 
And at this age, at when Eric was around two, was he still uh, clinging to his mother, going to her for affection? He, it was less than that. It was the summer of 1972. So he was only a year and a half. Uh-huh. Okay. And this is the same age we've been talking about. Mm -hmm. And when he was at that age, did uh, Kitty Menendez leave Hinsdale and go to New York to try to find a house? Yes, she did. And did she leave Eric behind with you? He, she left Eric behind with me. And how did Eric behave after his mother had left him behind with you? Overall. Eric was devastated. How do you know that? Well, and how did he act? I told you that. Okay. First of all, the pattern that he did about coming from his house to mine with a smile in his face to eat crackers at 7 o'clock in the morning was not, was then reversed one day only. Okay. I found him in his doorstep crying. At his house? At his house. Um, he was very attached to my husband. And Carlos would have to come home from work and be the one bathing him and dressing him because he wanted at that moment nobody else to touch him. He so was that devastated. Did he cry a lot? He cried continuously. I called her and uh, they came back for him. Do you know how long it was between the time they left him with you and when they came Only back? Only a week. But a for week that because I didn't, I, I couldn't, I, he was in too much pain. For that entire week, he cried. Yes. Mm -hmm. Now, you mentioned uh, when Miss Lansing was talking to you that Kitty thought you were overprotective in the way that you parented your children. Mm -hmm. Were I don't think so, but you know, sometimes you have ideas of yourself that are not accurate. And did you think, uh, and do you think it's it necessary for parents to protect children? Objection relevant. Sustained. Did you, did you discuss with uh, Kitty Menendez your notion that children should be protected from fearful things, from dangerous things? Objection, ask and answer. Overall. Okay. Yes, we discussed that. We discussed her opinion of what it was to raise, how she wanted to raise her children. All right, and this has been oh. asked and answered. Go on to something okay. else. Okay. Now, you've told us about an incident when your eldest daughter, Sylvia, went to uh, your brother's house because there was a, an, a, this was an electrical storm that had knocked out the power? Oh, yes. And this was nighttime? It was around 8 or 9 o'clock at night. It was dark. It's dark because in the wintertime at 5 o'clock it's dark, at least in the East Coast. So Eric was home alone in the dark uh, during this storm. He had been left alone for a few hours, yes. And when you indicated that Kitty got very upset when she discovered that Sylvia had gone over there, that Eric had called. Yes. And uh, did she explain why she was so upset? Objection, ask Sustained. <coughs> Had you ever said to Kitty Menendez that you did not think it was right for her to leave Eric alone in the house? Overall. I didn't have to because... All right, you've answered the question. You'd never said it to her? No. Did you have a discussion about leaving children alone yes. in the house? And in the course of that discussion, did you... She knew how strongly I felt. About not leaving children about alone? not leaving an unattended child, regardless of the age. <clears throat> you told us that um, after uh, Jose and Kitty moved to California, Kitty would call you at approximately 4 o'clock California time every single day. That is true. And you would talk to her every single day for about how long? An hour, an hour and a half. Did she tell you doing, during any of these phone calls about how she had gone to New York and searched for Jose's mistress, Louise? I was completely unaware of that. Did she tell you that she had caught Jose in a six-year-long affair? Objection, Mary. This calls for Stop being offered for truth, Your Honor. Objection, sustained. 
Did Kitty tell you her secrets? I don't think so. Did you know before she died that she had been in therapy for almost three years? Yeah, no. Overall, your answer? No, I did not know. Okay. Did you know before recently that Eric had suffered from learning disabilities when he was in school? Now, let me Objection overruled. You can answer the question. No, I did not know. All right, your next question, please. Did you know that Eric, the summer before they moved to California, attended a school for learning disabled called the Lewis School? No, I didn't know, which bothered me. Okay, not wait, wait, wait. You have to wait for another question. Now, no, I didn't know is the answer. No, I didn't know. Mrs. Baralt, do you have a daughter who needed some assistance in learning in school? Sustain. Were you, when you would talk to your sister-in-law, Kitty Menendez, would you share with her both the good and the bad about your children? Overall. Yes, I did. And you can't hide things like that. You didn't hide things like that, is that right? No. It's no shame in that. And did you, it's a fact. Did you discuss openly in front of Kitty the fact that one of your children needed some learning assistance? Sure. <coughs> but she never discussed that one of her children needed that assistance with you, is that right? No, she didn't. In fact, how did she describe to you Eric's performance academically over the years? Glowingly. And how did she describe uh, both Eric and Lyle's athletic performance over the years? In the same way, but those I attended, those I saw. So were there times when you actually saw that they didn't win every single match they ever <coughs> yes, played? Yes, and that's all right, yeah. And you thought that was all right, that they didn't win? Of course. So stay in the answer straight. Did, um, did Kitty Menendez ever tell you that she had written suicide notes and left them around for her children to find? Sustain. Did she ever talk to you about her thoughts of suicide? Overall. No, I did not know. Did you know before she died that there was even a hospitalization that looked like a, a suicide attempt? Rephrase the question. Yes. Did you learn before she died that she had been taken to a hospital for an overdose? No. Do you think you were the closest person to her? Overall, do you answer? I'd like to think that we were close. Did you know anyone that she spoke to as extensively or as frequently as you? Overall. I knew that she had discussed some of the learning problems with Faith Goldsmith. When did you know that? Recently. Okay, but we got to go back in time to not what you learned. You learned a lot of things after they died that you didn't know. Yes. Is that correct? <coughs> and I wish I had known more. It could have helped. Yes. All right, let's ask a question, please. Um, did Kitty complain to you about her missed career opportunities because she had children? Objection to relevant. Objection sustained. Did she express to you um, the desire that she would have preferred having girls to boy children? Objection to relevant. Sustained. Well, did you ever hear her say that in front of the boys? No, not in front of the boys. And finally, I wanted to show you some photographs uh, that I've, uh, with the court's permission, marked 209 and 210. I need to ask you, first of all, do you recognize the people in these photographs? Those are Lyle and Eric. And do you recognize the place where the photographs are taken? I can tell you when they were taken. It was Easter Sunday in front of St. Paul's after the Mass was over. 
And St. Paul's is a Catholic church. It's a Catholic church in Nassau, on Nassau Street in Princeton. And if I were to tell you that, and I will connect it later, that the notations on the original of this photograph indicates April 1978. Does that appear right based on how the boys look at those pictures? Uh, yes, that's about the, um, th that was the year they moved uh, to Princeton. Okay. They moved to the... From Muncie, well, they moved from Muncie to uh, the Princeton area, and I think that was the first um, Easter that we had there. That you had there together in the Princeton area. In the Princeton area. Okay. Correction, the first Easter was in 1977. I think this one was 1978. Can I ask you this? Yeah. Do you recall <clears throat> telling me two years ago okay. that they moved to the Princeton area in August of 1977? Yes, because so Eric went to school in the West Windsor <coughs> area that September. So and that April was of 1978, after the change in the year, would be the first Easter, wouldn't it? No. Because I moved in, yes, you're right. Because okay. I moved in the summer of 77. That's okay. true. You're correct. Thank you, Mrs. Ross. I have nothing further. Yes. <coughs> Mrs. Ross, yes. drawing your attention to the two photographs which have just been placed up here, of course. 210 and 209, I believe you indicated they were taken in front of a church. Is that correct? Yes. Did the family attend the church on the day that these photographs were taken? We all did. All right. Was it... Um, was it usual that the family attended church on occasion? Well, we attended Easter Sunday always together. When you say we, who's we? We, it's my husband, my children, Jose, Kitty, and the boys. And that was Catholic church, is that, that correct? That was Catholic church. That was at 1130 Mass, and then we went for breakfast. Aside from Easter Sunday, did you go to any other church services with um, your brother and his family? Not normally. But it was a tradition that you attended church on Easter. On Easter Sunday, yes, all of us together. Okay. Do you know whether or not um, the defendants were baptized? Yes, they were. I'm Lyle's godmother. All right. And do you know whether or not they received their first communion? Yes, they did. Okay. Now, um, was, was your sister-in-law, um, you knew her as Kitty, is that correct? I knew her as Kitty, yes. All right. Was your sister-in-law, Kitty Menendez, did she um, raise her sons in the Catholic faith? Yes, she did. I take it, was your family Catholic as well? Yes, and so was hers. All right. Before testifying today, did you have any meetings with the defense in this case? Oh, we've had a lot of meetings. Uh, these children have been in jail for over three years, and they're like my kids. Of course we have. You, you love them very much, don't you? I do love them, yes. Have I love Jose and Kitty, too. Well, have you heard some of the things that have been said about your brother since the defense case started? Yes. All right, the objection is withdrawn. Okay. Can you say anything nice about your brother, I Jose? can say a lot of very nice things. Did your brother, Jose, ever do anything nice for another human being? I think so. Um, I think um, this is a tremendous tragedy, and the tragedy is that these children love the parents. Something went definitely wrong in there. Okay, but uh, uh, I, no, Mrs. Mrs. Okay, Brock, go ahead. Could, did you ever see um, your brother do anything nice for his children? Yes. Okay, could you give me an example? Okay, I'll give you an example. When Lyle broke his collarbone, okay, he was playing soccer. And um, it resumed. The, I mean, the child went down and he stayed down. Jose was beside himself. He stopped the game because everybody continued. And uh, this happened in the course of a game. It was not like the game stopped and then they resumed. Nobody saw him. They saw him go down and stay down. He said to me, if Lyle is down and has not gotten up, he has to be very hurt. And he just interrupted that game and pulled him out. Sure enough, Lyle had a broken collarbone. Did he take him for treatment? Oh, I immediately. Did your, did your brother love his sons? Objection, Your Honor. That calls for speculation. Overall. I think he did. Uh, 
Yes, you can love somebody and still hurt them, you know. Okay, but it appeared to you that he loved his son? I think so, yes. Um, did you love your sister-in-law, Kitty Menendez? I love them both. Okay. Um, was Kitty fun to be around? Tremendously. Okay, why was she fun to be around? Okay. Kitty was very bright. She was, um, whenever you had them, in wherever, in a party, in a house, in a reunion, just sitting around the kitchen table, okay, there was, um, what can I say, there was never, you know how sometimes you're in a group of people and the conversation kind of dies with them, that never happened. Would you say they were lively? Very lively. Uh, Jose would come home, could come home from the office, and normally somebody would come home from the office and say, how was your day? So, oh, another day. Or It was like a soap. I mean, he always had something to say about his day. Did, and he, did he ever use his day as entertainment for other people? Definitely. I mean, he, his anecdotes, he could relate a story like nobody else. I believe you indicated that on occasion, Jose could look at a person and make them feel terrible. Um, did you ever see him make other people laugh? All the time. Uh, he, he, was, he was a very charismatic individual, okay? He was a lot of fun to be with, and if he liked you, he could be fantastic. If he didn't like you... Did you ever see him around people that he appeared to like? Of course. Uh, he liked you? He, I think we had a very close good relationship, yes. Did, um, did your brother Jose Menendez want his sons to do better than he had done? Clarify that for me. Well, did he, what want, do you the, mean? Did he want the best for his sons? He wanted the best for his son, and uh, he overlooked the fact that he was a self-driven individual. You can make somebody else be what you want them to be. They have to want it themselves. He was very driven. He was a very driven, successful person. Yes. And he, he was a successful businessman. Yes, he was. Now, you said that your um, sister-in-law, Kitty Menendez, liked to go shopping. Um, yes. Did your brother-in-law, uh, excuse me, did your brother make a lot of money? Did Jose make Jose made a lot of money, and he never held it back from Kitty. What I mean, the paycheck went into the account, and she spent it. All right. It's so the same in my house. Pardon me? It's the same in my house. Uh, okay. You get to spend your husband's money, too. Okay. When you moved to Chicago... Um, was there some sort of an employment relationship between your husband and Mr. Menendez? Yes. When Jose went in as president of Lions Container Services, he called Carlos to go in as his vice president of administration and finance. And that's why we moved to Chicago. So he <coughs> gave him, a, he gave your husband a job. Is that correct? My husband had a job, yes. He, my husband switched, yes. Right, I mean, he gave him a different job. Yes, a different job. And yeah. after um, your brother left and went back to New York, um, did your husband stay on in the job that he had obtained? No, there was a proxy file, so the Japanese took over. Okay, so you got a new job. We both got a new job. He with Hertz in the East Coast, and we stayed uh, with an appraisal firm in the Chicago area. Did your sister-in-law, Kitty Menendez, appear to love her sons? Yes. I think so. Okay. Now, I take it from your testimony that she treated them very differently from the way you treated your children. Is that correct? Definitely. Okay. Um, now, you have four daughters. Yes, I have. Okay. And I believe you've indicated that on occasion, um, Kitty Menendez would tell you that she thought you were overprotective. Yes. Okay. Um, do you think there's a difference between raising daughters and raising sons? You see, this is why mainly sometimes we did not, I don't think basically there should be a difference, okay? But I never went go into an argument with her about that because she always would say, well, Terry, you have girls. And I thought, well, maybe there's a difference. I didn't have a boy to prove that, it, that there shouldn't have been, you know. And she didn't have a daughter. And she didn't have a daughter, exactly. I believe you indicated that you went on vacation with the Menendez family. Often, yes. Uh, uh, what kind of vacations would you go on? Okay. Um, when we went to Hilton Head, we rented two condos. They had their condo, we had ours, and we spent a week there. Uh, we did that a couple of times. Uh, we uh, went to Canada, to Kitty's uh, father's uh, camp, for another week there. We went to... Hmm. I mean, it was different until 
they started making a lot of money and we couldn't afford to go in their vacations. All right, so this would have, this would have happened, what, up, up to the until, middle? Until so. around 1970s. The last time that we went on a vacation together, um, Lyle was going out with, St with Stacy because Stacy came along. So he must have been around 16. Okay, so Stacy went on the vacation? Yeah. Stacy, Lyle, Kitty, and I. Jose was away, and I think Eric was at, in camp. All right, and where did you go on vacation then with Stacy? We, uh, we went to Hilton Head. Okay. Were you aware that the family took other vacations in which you weren't involved? Oh, most definitely. What other kinds of places did they go to that you okay. were aware of? Okay, they went uh, on a diving vacation in the Cayman Islands. You know and they else? took, they, they got certified. And did they take their sons on that vacation? Oh, yes. Okay. Do you know of any other vacations they took their sons on that you were not present for? There was one in Key West. Um, there was, um, I don't know, these children were always traveling. Uh, they were traveling with them, mainly tennis, uh, traveling related uh, experiences. Do you know about what age it was that they start that the defendants started traveling for tennis? I mean, traveling further than an hour for a local match. When was it that they started traveling some distance? What ages were they? Gosh, uh, I would say traveling any distance. Eleven, twelve. And teenage years, definitely. Because right, so uh, I don't think Lyle started playing tennis until he was around 9 or 10. Okay, so um, about the ages of 11 or 12, for each of the defendants, they started to travel some distance to participate in matches. Is that correct? And that's one, one of the things that Kitty and I had a disagreement on. On uh, Thanksgiving, Jose and, and Lyle were never there. And I think Lyle resented that a little bit. All right, but so they weren't there on Thanksgiving because they were traveling for tennis? Um, Eric and Kitty were always there. Jose and Lyle were always at Fort Washington for a tournament. Okay, and where's Fort Washington? It's um, like an hour and a half from us, but by the time they would get home on Thanksgiving night, he would have missed all the fun, and he resented that, I think. Now, did you participate in family gatherings where you and your sister Marta and your brother Jose and all the kids would get together? Yes. Uh, it wasn't very often for Marta, but, uh, but yes. Okay. Would you say that you were closer to your brother than um, Marta was? <coughs> oh, there's no question about it. Well, there's no question. What's the, an what's the answer? Uh, yes. yes. Okay. All right. Um, and for a long period of time, Marta didn't even live. She lived in Puerto Rico. She lived in Puerto Rico, exactly. Did you ever see your sister-in-law, um, Kitty Menendez, hit her, either of her children, strike them? I didn't. Uh, so you never saw that? No, I did not see it. And I believe that you've indicated that out of the 29 years that, yes. you, were, um, that you knew them, that you lived within 15 minutes of them for 14 and a half. 14 and a half. And during those 14 and a half years, would you see them at least once a week, the Menendez family? Mainly on the weekends, yes. Okay, but, but then at least once a week. Oh, yes. Okay. I want to ask you about these incidents. With, um, you said about 15. That's one five. One 15 five. 15 times. Um, that Eric, Eric came over to the house? Yes. Yes. Was he ever injured on his trek across the grasslands to your house? No. Okay. No. Um, and I believe you said it happened 15 times. About how old was he when it stopped? Well, they moved out when Eric, uh, that... Eric was less than two years old. Okay, so it was between... So this happened in a period of three months, All right, okay, so or two months, somewhere in there. Okay. Did you ever see your brother, Jose Menendez, strike either of his children? I didn't. I believe you indicated that Lyle spent, Lyle Menendez spent a lot of time at your home. During yes. which period of time was this? Okay. Lyle started driving at 18, and um, that's when Lyle started to be free, to, you know, to come without having to wait for somebody to bring him. And mainly when he was at Princeton, 
he lived in my house. He had a room <coughs> at Princeton, but he stayed in my house. I'm only th uh, five miles from Princeton. Okay. Um, so when he stayed at your, when he was at Princeton, then and he stayed at your house, would he stay there what four or five nights of, out of the week or more? Every day. He lived there. He had a room. Okay. When when Donovan Goudreau was his friend, did Donovan also live with you? Donovan stayed there ninety percent of the time. All right, so Lyle, was, Lyle Menendez was welcome in your home, is that correct? I loved having him there. Was his brother Eric also welcome in your home? Eric was in California. But he would have been welcome in your he home? He would have been welcome, yes. Would you say you have a close relationship with your nephew, Lyle Menendez? I think so. Um, when uh, Lyle Menendez was a student at Princeton University, um, were you aware that he um, left the university for a period of about a year? Yes, I did. Were his parents upset about that? <coughs> Overall. Also calls for Houston. His parents were upset. Wait, wait, hold on a second. Yeah. Under 1250, Your Honor. Right, the objection is overruled. Okay. This is not received for the truth, just what was said. What, Lyle was asked to leave the university? Yes. Yeah, I also object under 402, which is not likely to be under. Okay, you may come up here. All right, your next question, please. Yeah. After your brother and your sister in law were killed, when did you come to California? Immediately. Was it? I, uh, we received a call from Jose's secretary somewhere close to. Uh, noon, which is 9 o'clock California time. All right, that would have been Monday the 21st of August? The 21st of August, and uh, I think we came 5 o'clock flight. So you arrived uh, on <coughs> the 21st as well, is that correct? Yes. And how long did you stay in California during that period of time? We went back with the bodies to for burial in the Princeton area. I, everything is very confusing. I think it was either Saturday Saturday, Saturday the 26th. I, whenever the bodies left, we left. I, those are times where I am not very clear. I don't remember when. I think the, um, the memorial services were either Friday. I think they were Friday. You can correct me on that because you have the dates, I'm sure. Uh, we left with the bodies, and then there were memorial services in the Princeton area, and I think burial was Monday. So you attended the memorial service in Los Angeles? Yes. And did either one of the two defendants speak at that service? I'm going to object that this is beyond the scope. Overall. 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 Overall.
All right, there is um, some brief matters that um, the lawyers and I want to uh, discuss further with this witness and uh, discuss among ourselves, and we'll do that now, and uh, we'll resume tomorrow at uh, 9 o'clock. I'll ask that both juries return at 9 o'clock and remind you not to discuss this case among yourselves or with anyone else. Don't form any final opinions about the matter, and we'll see everybody back here tomorrow at 9 o'clock. All right, I believe all the uh, jurors have left, um, although I haven't received notice from the bailiff. I think they have. You had some questions um, that you wanted to ask of uh, this witness. Um, did you want to do that now? Certainly. Okay. Um, Mrs. Burrell, were uh, Jose Menendez and Kitty Menendez upset about the fact that Lyle had been asked to leave Princeton? You know, yes, they were, but I was uh, I was amazed. Uh, Jose was the one who came over to the East Coast, and I would have I was expecting him to rave and rant. He uh, took Lyle, and I I gave them privacy. I think their parent is entitled to have privacy with their kid, especially on something like that, and. Um, they discussed it, like what happened and what was the next step. Uh, but I imagined, yes, that he, of course they were upset. Well, I'm going to object to what the witness imagined you were describing. All right, that part of the answer is true. Um, so you were aware that, that your brother was in the, on the East Coast because of the fact that Lyle had been asked to leave Princeton. We called him. Who called him? We did. Who's we? My husband and I. You called? Lyle came over to my house. Did he tell you what had happened? Yes. And you are the one that informed him? Well, no. We said Lyle, I think, because he didn't think it was that big a deal. Um, Who? Lyle didn't think that it was that big a deal because when it happened, he it was not done, he didn't do it to cheat. He had done it with permission, the only thing he overstepped, okay? And um, he came and told us the story. We were sitting at dinner time. And I said, Lyle, I mean, you have to tell your parents this is a little more serious than you really think. And that's when we called his father, uh, Carlos called his father, more or less explained to him and put Lyle on the phone. Now, had he already had a hearing where he'd been asked? No. Okay, so this is what No, this is what, he had been called by the dean and said, these charges have been brought, uh, you know, about uh, that. And a complaint has been uh, by one of the TAs have been lodged against you. Did it appear to you that Lyle told you about what had happened relatively soon after he had found out? That day. Okay. And then it was that night that your husband called uh, we, brother? We called together. Let me put it this way. Okay. And at some point your brother came back? Immediately. I think it was the next day or immediately. Do you know how long after that it was that, they act, that the school decided that he should leave? This was, if I am correct, this was sometime in, in December. I may be wrong on that date because I don't remember too well about that. And um, it was not a long period of time. I would say a week or so. Okay. And then you've indicated that, that your sister in law, Kitty Menendez, used to call you. Uh, every night at 7 o'clock during dinner? While Lal was in school. Okay, now was this before the um, before he was asked to leave or when he had returned? When he had returned. This was the spring of 1989. And so it was at that time that the telephone call started from your sister-in-law? Yes. Okay. Um, did, were you ever aware of the fact that your sister-in-law knew about what had happened with Lyle at Princeton? In other words, did she ever say anything to you about it? We talked about it, but very lightly, it was something that happened, and all right. So you actually spoke with your sister-in-law. Yes, I did. About the fact that that Lyle had been asked to leave Princeton. Well, Jesus. when we made that call to Jose, it was at home, and it was two parents talking to two parents and a kid there. And, and she was on the phone as well. Well, I wasn't even on the phone myself. I was listening to one side of the conversation. Okay, I'm sure the uh, the conversation took place between Lyle and his father and Carlos San Jose. Right. Um, but did you personally ever speak to your sister-in-law about Yes, we talked about it. 
she was upset about it, disappointed. But what do you do? I mean, um, when she called you at every night at seven o'clock, and the spring semester started in 1989. Yes. Um, was she concerned about Lyle? Kitty didn't call me because she said I am concerned about Lyle. Kitty called me, and we talked about the Calabasas house <coughs> being redone, about daily life. Never mentioned to me that all the problems that they were having. Never, never hinted that there was any problem. She just wanted to know how Lyle was doing, how is Lyle, how is school. And Kitty had a way of extracting information from you. I mean, she was difficult to say. It's not like if you tell me I don't want to talk about it or I don't want to say, I drop it. Not kidding. So she would make inquiries about her son when she called you. Yes. Now, Your Honor, I'm, I'm going to just, I thought that the purpose of the 402 was with regard to the leaving Prince Commission. We're now into the spring of 89, which is... Yes. Uh, we're trying to show you a connection between the two events, Your Honor. Let me, I just have one more Sorry. question. In the, in the fall of 87, when Lyle started his freshman year at Princeton, yeah. did she call you every night? No. Okay. That's all. All right, any examination on that limited subject? Hang on. I would like to, I know it's none of my business. Well, let me suggest the data. All right, you want to confer about this? No, I just want to make sure none of this happens in front of my jury, that's all. Well, that's something that you can address to the court, not to Ms. Lansing. No, no, I know. I was asking, suggesting that she wants to deal with it a different way, so that just reinforces the separate people. All right, any questions on, uh, on the subject? Okay. All right. All right, um, we'll also have uh, the reporter find reference uh, in the uh, direct testimony regarding that one subject. Uh, Reporters um, can confer. I don't know which one took down that particular area, and we'll discuss that tomorrow the morning. Trial. We have uh, both juries uh, present, as well as all the other participants in the trial. Good morning to all the jurors. Welcome back. And we're uh, resuming the cross-examination of the witness who was on the witness stand. Would you state your name again for us, please? Teresita Baralt. All right. I'll remind you that you're still under oath. Yes, sir. All right. You may continue your cross-examination. Do yes. you remember yesterday we were asked questions on direct examination about um, Lyle Menendez's spending habits both before and after his parents' death? Do you remember that testimony? Yes, I do. And I believe you indicated that he always spent a lot of money both before and after. Yes. Uh, did he spend more money afterwards than he had previously spent? Yes. As a matter of fact, did you disapprove of the amount of money that he spent after his parents' death? I was very worried. Okay. <laughs> I was very worried, but I, I was worried about a lot of things about the children. They were in pain, which was normal. Uh, okay, but, but yesterday when you characterized the spending yes. as being a lot before and a lot after, um, did you mean to imply that it was equivalent or it was the same? Well, no, he had more after. He had more money afterwards? Yes. And he spent a lot of money? Yes. Okay. Lyle didn't have much regard for money. I mean, money didn't mean much to Lyle. But he bought things after his parents' death. He bought things, correct? Yes, and he bought before, too. But the things that he bought after his parents' deaths were of a greater, I mean, he bought a lot more expensive things. He had more things. money. And he bought a lot of expensive things, didn't he? Yes. Things he, he couldn't have purchased before his parents' yeah, death. Overall. Overall. He bought the kinds of things after his parents' death that he couldn't have purchased before. Probably because he had more money. After the deaths? Yes. Okay. Now, directing your attention to um, 1987 through 89, uh, let me ask you this. Okay. When um, your brother and his family moved to California, Yes. Um, how often did you see them per year? Okay. Sustain. All right. How, how often did you see the family all together? 
Okay, they moved in August, August, September. Um, they came at least three times before Thanksgiving. They came in Thanksgiving and they spent Christmas with us. And that was in 1986? And that was in 1986. Okay, how about the, the year 1987? Okay, my father died in 87, so they came for a long time there. Uh, at that time, Lyle was in Australia on a tennis tournament. Uh, Eric came with them. So it was um, Eric Menendez, your brother, and your sister-in-law? Who came for the funeral, and they stayed like a week, two weeks. Okay, um, I saw them again. You're talking 87, let me, let me think. That was also a year of a lot of pain for me, so <coughs> it's a little blurry on exact um, times. Did you see them at Christmas of 87, if you recall? I, I think we saw, I don't want to say yes if it's, I'm not sure. I'm not completely sure if uh, Christmas of 80, I know I didn't see them on 88. You did um, I don't think I saw them at Christmas per se of 87. I did see them in 86. Did you see them at Christmas of 1988? The no. Last? All right. No. And so um, in the fall of 1987, Lyle Menendez had started at Princeton University, is that correct? Yes. And were you ever in his company when his father or mother came to visit? Yes. And I believe you indicated they came on several occasions while he was at Princeton, is that correct? Yes, they did. Uh, Jose had a lot of trips into the New York, and he always made a point of coming to Princeton to see Lyle. Even if it was only an overnight visit for whatever. And on occasion he brought his wife with him, is that correct? Kitty traveled with him very frequently. <clears throat> and that's during this time period that we're talking about of 87 through 89? Yes. Uh, so in the fall of 1987, Lyle Menendez was a freshman at Princeton University, mm -hmm. and then in the spring of 1988 he was asked to leave, is that correct, for a year? I think he was asked to leave I believe in January. All right, I, I, I mischaracterized January, spring, but it was January oh, of 88. Yes. Okay. And um, how, did you know that he'd been um, asked to leave the yes. university? Yes, yes. Did he tell you? Well, he told me, Jose told me. It was, like I told you yesterday, this happened in my house, so I was perfectly aware of what was going on. Okay, so Lyle Menendez told, came to you one day in late 1987 and told you that that he had some problems at school, is that correct? Yes. What did he tell you? Objection here, sir. 12-20. All right, it's not received for the uh, truth of the matter stated, just to reflect the state of mind of the individual making the statement. Okay. What did Lyle Menendez tell you? I don't think Lyle, um, okay, Lyle didn't think he had cheated. Uh, he had had permission from the teacher's assistant to go and get the notes from the lab partner. So was that and an he did. Okay. So there was an so did Lyle tell you that he had been accused of cheating? Oh yeah. All right. And did you do something? Either you or your husband do something the same day that Lyle gave you this information? Yes, we we told him. I said, Lyle, I think this is serious matter. He said. And Terry, I didn't cheat. I said, well, they're accusing you. You have to take it seriously. And so he said, I think you should call your parents and inform them of, of this. He said, but this is, I didn't cheat. I said, but you're accused of it. And uh, that's when we picked up the phone. Uh, my husband talked to Jose. I said, I think Lyle has a problem. So talked about it and put Lyle on the phone and he explained to his parents exactly what he had explained to me. Shortly thereafter, did Mr. Menendez then come to um, the Princeton area? Yes. Within how many days of this phone call did he leave? I, I don't remember exactly. I think that, I, th I think he came when there was supposed to be a hearing on, uh, in front of the uh, Honor Code Society, I don't know, Princeton has their own little formal thing. And uh, he came over for that and he, he talked to the dean. Now, when um, your brother came to see his son, um, did, he, did they ever have any meetings at your house before this academic committee met? In other words, did you ever see Jose Menendez with his son um, discussing this incident? Yes, I did. 
did, was he um, angry with his son, or did he appear to be angry? Jose wasn't angry. Jose blamed the university for it. All right. He yeah. didn't think, you know. Did, so he, he didn't express anger towards his son in any way for this incident? No. You, uh, all right. No, I'm sorry, no. Okay. <laughs> um, subsequent to that, uh, did Lyle Menendez stay out of Princeton University for a full year? You have to. And uh, yes. And then in the, um, the, I guess it's the spring or the winter term, in, in January or early February of 1989, did he return to the university? He returned to Princeton, I think it was around the 1st of February of 89. Now, I believe you indicated yesterday that um, Mrs. Menendez used to call you every night at about 7 o'clock during your dinner hour. Dinner time for us, yes. Was that during his first semester at Princeton or his second semester in 1989? Not as much the first semester at Princeton because on his first semester he pretty much stayed in the dorm. Uh, on the spring of 89 he stayed at my house. So you had more contact with him the second semester that he was at Princeton versus the first, is that correct? Well physically he was more there, he was there during the night, but uh, when the first semester he was there during the day. All right, so your waking hours were about the same? About the same. Okay. Yes. Uh, but after Lyle Menendez returned to Princeton University, it was at that time that, the mo that his mother would call every single night? Yes. Okay. And when he was a freshman, his first semester freshman year in 1987, she <coughs> called you, didn't she? Two or three times a week. Okay. And so by the time of the spring of 89, it had increased to a daily phone call? Yes. Okay. I believe you indicated that Mrs. Menendez wanted you to have a key to the condominium um, in which Lyle Menendez was going to live during his next semester at Princeton. Yes. Okay. And I believe that you indicated that um, the purpose for you having the key was to determine whether or not Lyle Menendez was living with his girlfriend at that. Was to check on him. Oh, to check on him. But what were you supposed to check? Were, were you supposed to check to see that specifically Jamie was not living there? Okay. And at the time he was approximately 21 years old. Is that correct? Yeah, he, he was 21. And his parents didn't want him living with his girlfriend in the condominium. Is that correct? That's correct. Now, I'd like to draw your attention to some of the testimony yesterday about some of the earlier childhood experiences. I okay. believe you indicated at one point that you attended a theme park with Mrs. Menendez. Great Adventure. It was called Great Adventures? Mm -hmm. And that there was a an attraction that Eric Menendez did not want to participate in. Yes. You remember that? Now, could you describe? I, I've forgotten what it was. Okay. It's like a big tent. And um, when you walk in, you fall. I mean, there is no balance because you're walking on uh, kind of tubes with air. So it's inflated. Okay. You got it. Uh, and <laughs> Eric Menendez wouldn't go inside of that. Is that correct? No. Eric was not a daring child by nature. Okay. Now, I believe you've indicated that his mother was... Um, I guess ridicule is probably the right word, or she she certainly made it known to him that she was not Kitty happy. was very annoyed. Okay. Did she ever pick him up and throw him in? No. Okay, so so her, to express her displeasure, she verbally told him. Yes. Okay, but he didn't go in. Objection, argument. Overall. Right. He didn't go in. He just cried. I think you indicated he stood his ground. I think that's what you said. Uh, yeah, but by the time he left, he felt pretty bad about it. I mean, he had been, his opinion of himself was like. D did Eric cry a lot as a child? <coughs> I don't think so. Um, you've indicated that um, during the period of time when you lived near the Menendez family, when your children were growing up, that you saw them principally on the weekends. Is that correct? What are you talking, Princeton? or yes. Okay. During the Princeton years, mainly on the weekend. Their schedule didn't allow for any kind of uh, anything <coughs> except during the years that Eric was swimming. And then I saw him nightly because my youngest was a swimmer. Did your, um, so this was your youngest daughter who was also a swimmer? Yes, and they're the same age. All right. And <coughs> did um, either of the defendants play with your children during any of these family <coughs> gatherings? Yes. Were they close to their cousins? They were very close.
Now, going back to um, 1989, I believe you okay. indicated that in June of 1989, at the end of Lyle Menendez's freshman year, yes. that um, someone came and helped him move out of his dorm room. My mother and I. And at the time that he moved out of his dorm room, was um, his brother Eric Menendez in the Princeton area? Uh, Eric had come over for the weekend. And did he travel by himself, or was he with uh, one of his parents? No, he traveled by himself. Um, did you pick him up at the airport? Do you remember? I don't remember. So um, I may have, or Lyle may have. I, I don't re really remember. So Eric Menendez was present during this time period when you were helping Lyle Menendez move out of his dorm room. Is that correct? Was he present at the <coughs> university when you were helping? That morning? No. All right. Did you ever see him present at the university during the course of that weekend? Well, I wasn't at the university. I only went there to help pack, and that was only that morning. And where did Eric Menendez stay? When My house. Okay, thank you. I believe you indicated that Mrs. Menendez had some plans for early September yes. of 1989. Yes. I'd like to go over those briefly. Sure. I, th I think you said that on the September the 4th, she was going to go to Princeton. No. Okay. I said the September the 4th was the, cl the date set for the closing of the condo. Okay. And she was going to go on September the 9th to l get Lyle set up and buy furniture for his condo. And she had to return because on the 24th she had to go to UCLA for Eric. Okay. Was it your understanding that Eric Menendez was going to live on the campus at UCLA? That was my understanding. Or live away from home? Yes. Okay. And uh, referring to this condominium, uh, Princeton has housing for its students, doesn't it? Princeton does have housing. Do you, are you aware or do you know what the reason was that he was going to be, that Lyle Menendez was going to live in a condominium? Yes. Um, first of all, Lyle was, uh, normally Princeton students stay in campus. They have to on freshman year. And I think on sophomore year, so, some that do, the majority, the majority of them do some leave. Uh, Lau was by that time a couple of years older than the majority of the freshmen, okay, and uh, he didn't like living on a dorm. Well, most kids don't, but he was old enough and the university allowed him to live away. Now, this um, condominium that he was going to live in, I think you said it was going to close. Does that mean his parents purchased it or was it rented? No, his parents purchased it. I helped choose it. And it was exactly two miles from campus on the right side of Route 1. That means he didn't have that traffic. Okay. Did he have an automobile in this, in the, the winter, spring semester of 1989? Yes. Overall. Did he have an automobile at the Yes, university? he did. Okay. And this condominium, could you describe it for me, please? Sure. It's... Um, <coughs> and there was how, how big was it? How many bedrooms? I think you said two bedrooms. It had two complete suites. So that means the bathroom and the bedrooms were It had a living room, a dining room, a uh, corner fireplace, a um, laundry room with washer and dryer, two huge bedrooms, two full baths. Do you know how many square feet? It's around 2,000. <coughs> Between 18 and 2,000. And that's where he was going to be living that yes. semester? Yes. Then I believe you indicated that on September the 24th, Mrs. Menendez was going to have to be back in Los Angeles for the purpose of taking her younger son <coughs> off to college. Uh, yes. Eric uh, would be staying at UCLA, and that's where she was going, the and 24th. Do you, do you know whether he was going to live in student housing there, or was he going to have an apartment, or uh, do you know? No, no, no. I think he was uh, living in student housing. Uh, that's my understanding. When was the last time that you spoke to your brother? before he died, if you recall. Well, we were in constant communication because of the condo. I mean, he had uh, called me and said, I want you to go and help Lyle look for a place to live, which I did. And then Lyle saw this condo and loved it. And then I called him. He said, I want Carlos to go see it uh, to make sure that it is it was worth it, let me put it this way, financially. And um, Carlos went over and we, so we were in constant communication because we were the Princeton link with regards to the condo and the purchasing and all that. But do you have any specific recollection as to the last conversation that you had with your brother before he died? In other words, do you know if it was within a week of his death or days or? I talked to him 
after he came back from nationals. And I know that I had then left for Bermuda with my youngest child. And uh, the day that I came back, I had a couple of messages from him because he had been in Princeton that day. He had stayed at my mother and that was a Wednesday before he died. But I didn't get to talk to him. All right, so when, so when you returned So it was somewhere in early part of August that we talked to him last. And you were aware that the Wednesday before he died, he had spent the He night spent the night at my mother's, yes. Who lives like an hour away from us. I believe you indicated um, during your direct examination that you saw a change between Mr. and Mrs. Menendez and the way that your brother treated his wife at some point. And what I wanted to ask you was, when was that that you first noticed the change? I noticed it at my parents, at my father's uh, funeral. And that was in February? Uh, February of 87. Okay. Did you see them, did you see Mr. and Mrs. To get Menendez together again after your father's funeral? Very often. And did you see that same sort of behavior exhibited by your brother towards? I saw that behavior until 89. I th thought maybe I should move to California, it does help. So, <laughs> so it, it, did no, it did mark a change in his behavior when, yes. he came, when they came to California. Mm -hmm. Is that yes? I mean, it, there was a change in their behavior? Yes. Yes, okay. very you much so. You made a noise and the court reporter couldn't take it down, that's why I asked oh, you to repeat okay. it all. Okay. Did you ever see your uh, brother be abusive towards either of his children, and, and I mean physically abusive? Overall. Do you understand the question? Yes, I understand the question. I didn't. You never saw it. After... You mean physically? Yes, I mean physical. Okay. After um, your brother and your sister-in-law died, um, I believe you indicated, and I think I asked you as well, that um, the defendant stayed with you on occasion at your home in the Princeton area. Is that correct? You mean Eric and Lyle? Yes. Yes. Um, and I think you indicated that Eric never stayed more for than for more than 24 hours. Uh, Eric only stayed a week when he got very sick uh, with severe stomach pains. And uh, go ahead. Do you remember when the pol um, Detective Zoller and some other detectives came to see you in about September the 17th of 19? Yes, I do remember. And yes. at that time, both Eric Menendez and his brother Lyle Menendez were at your home. We're at my house. Okay. Yes. So it was my mother and half the world. And. Um, <laughs> Had you talked to Eric Menendez about um, the events of the night of August the 20th as of that time? I'm going to object to this as beyond the scope. Overall, you can answer the question. No, I did not. Right. Did you talk to Lyle Menendez um, after his parents' death and, and before the police officers came to see you on September the 17th? Had you spoken to Lyle Menendez? About what? About the death? Yes. No, I did not. Okay. Um, after his parents' death, did Lyle Menendez indicate to you that he thought he was being followed? Objection, Your Honor, hearsay. Respect All right, is this being offered for the truth? No, it's not. All right, the objection is overruled. It will not be received for the truth of the statement, just the state of mind of the declarant. The yes. All right, and... I object that that's not relevant with respect to Overruled. And did, did he, in fact, did Lyle Menendez hire bodyguards? Yes. Thank you. I have nothing for All right. Uh, redirect. <coughs> Mrs. Burrell? Yes. Mrs. Bazanich asked you a number of questions, and I'd like to follow up on some of them. Okay. She asked you if your brother had a good sense of humor. Remember that? Yes, he did. Did he tend to get sarcastic? Yes, he did. Okay. And was his humor sometimes at other people's expense? That is, he would, they would be the, they would be the source of the humor or the joke? Sometimes. Um, what, did he have, did you see him sometimes tell people false <coughs> things? 
like somebody's got false teeth or somebody's not supposed to have coffee or somebody has cancer and then everybody yes. in the party would treat that person in a strange way? Yes. Okay. Right. So he, so the humor was sometimes at other people's expense. Yes. And um, could he also use his humor or his sarcasm as a way of communicating displeasure, that he disagreed with people? Like in, in a discussion, would he get sarcastic if he <coughs> had a different point of view than you did? Sometimes, but he didn't have to resort to that. He would tell you straight out. In no uncertain terms? In no uncertain terms. And would he, t would he do that with his children as well? In terms of telling them pretty straight out what he thought, what he expected of them? I think so. I think he was pretty clear. Um, you were asked whether um, he wanted the best for his son, and you said you can't make children want to succeed. What did you mean by that? Well, he and many parents do in general, uh, you want things for your children, and you want them, and you've never stopped to really think, is that what they want for themselves? And uh, Jose had a tremendous amount of inner drive. That's why he got where he was so fast. Nobody pushed him. He pushed himself. And uh, he wanted his children to succeed. Most parents do, but he was relentless. You know, I mean, he, it, it was going to be done, period. And um, I think he forgot to ask the children if that's what they wanted. You were asked if um, <coughs> there's a difference in the way girls are raised versus way, the way boys are raised, and, when, and we were talking particularly about protectiveness. Do you remember? I remember. Uh, they, they had their own ideas of how th the difference between raising a little girl and a little boy, which we didn't share. I think a baby is a baby, and there's no sex to it. So an 18-month-old, be it girl or boy, yeah, crossing well, the street yes. is still in danger. They didn't believe in cuddling in, uh, because you don't want to make this little boy a little girl. Do you know, girls is okay, but in boys you treat them, you know, a little more businesslike. It's not the same cuddling, and we disagree basically on that. Well, do you think there's a difference between a three-year-old girl and a three-year-old boy in terms of being exposed to a dangerous dog? No, neither an eight-year-old girl or a year-old boy, either. Did you talk to Kitty and Jose about the fact that, that you thought that the children were exposed to danger? Or, or do you think that's the kind of thing you have a right to do? Objection, beyond the scope. Can I have a question right back, please? Did you talk to Kitty and Jose about the fact that you thought the children were exposed to danger, or do you think that's the kind of thing that you have a right to do? Rephrase the question, please. You talked about the difference in perspective mm -hmm. that you have with regard to girls versus boys and exposing mm -hmm. children to danger. Did you ever express your concerns in that area to Kitty and Jose? I did, but remember they were, they thought All that right, was you've answered the question. And did they seem to welcome your suggestions? No. Did they make it clear to you whether they wanted your input or not? I don't think they came right out and said it. Remember, they thought I was overprotective. Okay. So it's obsolete what I think, you know. Anything I think, it's just dismissed. The family gatherings, I think you were asked uh, yes. about family gatherings. Did the kids like to go to family they gatherings? They loved them. I think they loved them more than any other kid in the room. They played, did they get to play with other kids there? They loved. Uh, mine, Martha's, okay. and, the, did and Carlos Menendez's. Did Lyle and Eric like going to the family gatherings? They loved it. 
And is it Lyle and Eric you were talking about who loved it more than the other kids? Yes. They seem to be really happy there playing with the other children. They love family. That's uh, one of the comments that Lyle always made when he came to my house. I have a very happy family and it's always full of young people. Don't ask me why. I haven't experienced the empty nest yet. But um, he loved coming over and uh, more so than any other child. Did that cause problems with Kitty, the fact that he loved being at your house so much? When he, was, when he was a child, did, was there some resentment because he was so happy at your house? Well, he, when he was a child, he wasn't brought as sober <coughs> as when he was able to drive and come over. He was a what? He, when he was a child, they didn't bring him as often as when he was able to drive, and then he was there all the time. And, okay, so was there some resentment at that point once he could come over on his own? I think so. I, yes. Um, you were asked by Mrs. Bazanich about um, the situation in which Lyle was accused of cheating at Princeton. Yes. And he was subsequently suspended for a year. Mm -hmm. Is that correct? Yes. And your understanding is that it had something to do with him borrowing some lab notes and turning in work based on somebody else's lab notes. Is that yes. generally correct? Uh, yes. Uh, okay. He, yes. Okay. Now, when Jose and Kitty were told about this, you said that <coughs> Jose flew in. Is that correct? Yes. And was he there to reprimand Lyle or was he there to make sure Lyle stayed in Princeton? He was there to make sure Lyle stayed at Princeton. I think the main issue was forgotten, which was that there was cheating involved. Your Honor, I move to strike. I think that as being non-responsive, okay. as being speculation. Sustain the answer, Did you um, sit in on conversations with your brother with regard to this issue? Regard to the Princeton I don't remember that. I remember him being there. I remember being talked about it, but I don't remember sitting with him. Okay, but you remember hearing him talk about the situation. Is that yes. correct? Was yes. Was his concern over the fact there had been cheating or over the fact that his son was going to be thrown out of Princeton? Based on what you heard, was the concern because his son had cheated, or was the concern because he was going to be thrown out of Princeton? Because he was... It, it's based on, I asked what she heard. The way you phrased it. Okay. Did you hear Jose Menendez say whether his concern was that Lyle had cheated or his concern was that Lyle was going to be thrown out of Princeton? I think the concern at that time was that he was going to be asked to leave the university. Objection sustained. The answer is true. Did you know that throughout high school, uh, Lyle and Eric, Lyle's parents had done homework for him? I'm asking if she knew, Your Honor. Overall. Yes, I did. Okay. And did you know? that Lyle's father had, in fact, written a paper for Lyle while he was at Princeton. Yes, the Federal Express paper came to my house. Okay. Had you ever had any conversations with your brother or his wife with regard to the fact that they participated in helping Lyle cheat in school? Yes, we discussed that. <coughs> Did you feel this was wrong behavior? Sustained. Did they express they thought this was wrong behavior? No, they didn't think there was anything wrong with that. Were they very <coughs> upset, Kitty and Jose, about the fact that Lyle was not going to be in Princeton for a period of time? Kitty was angry. Did Kitty, in fact, lie to people about it? Yes, which placed me in a very difficult position. 
So she didn't want anybody to know? No. I think you told us in, in some detail the number of times that you saw the family in 1986 after they moved, which was three times before Thanksgiving, Thanksgiving, and then Christmas. Yes. In 1987, uh, your father died in February, I believe. Yes. So you saw them at the funeral. Did you see them again in 1987? Yes, I did see them because at that time they were in the process of selling the Mountain uh, Avenue home. So they were back in New Jersey. <coughs> yes. Do you have any especially Jose? Okay. Do you have any idea how many times in 1987 uh, Jose was back in New Jersey and you saw him? I don't remember. He was there often because yes. there were negotiations going on. Is often to you five times in the year, ten times in the year, oh. fifteen times? Often to me means two times a month, approximately. So 1987, Jose was in Princeton about twice a month. Yes? Yes. Okay. And was Kitty with him? Some of the time, all of the time, never? Some of the time. Now what about 1988? I didn't see that much of them in 88. And what does not that much mean? You only that saw them means four or five that times, uh, I may have seen, I don't think I, I, I saw Kitty maybe two or three times in the year because uh, at that time Lal was not in Princeton. So they weren't back there as often? They were not. Okay. And were they calling as often when he wasn't back in Princeton? <laughs> I w no, I was not talking to her as often. Now, the condominium that you're talking about, it was due to close in September. Yes. When was it initially purchased? When was the decision made to actually buy that condo? I think we're talking July. And were Kitty and Jose coming back and looking at the condo or just taking your word for it? They were taking Carlos, uh, Jose was taking Carlos's financial word for it and they were taking my personal opinion for it. Okay. Yes. And did Lyle get to see the condo? Lyle shows the condo. Okay. So he was back there looking at condos along with you? Yes. He came over for a couple of weeks and uh, we looked at first apartments to rent in the Princeton area, inside, outside, everywhere. And then finally we saw this. And you said it had two complete suites? Yes. Now, was one of them to be for Kitty and Jose when they came back to visit? Well, one of them, they were going to furnish it, and um, it, it, the, he could use it. He could have friends over, but it, if they came into the Princeton area, they could stay there. So if Kitty and Jose came to the Princeton area, they could stay in the condominium? Yes. And was Jose still making frequent trips to the Princeton area? Was he, was he still there about twice a month? Yes, for one for the night. Okay. And when you um, were given or were asked to take the key so that you could check whether Jamie had moved in, was Lyle still going with Jamie at that time, or had they already split up? They had, but he had come in July and had gone over. I think it was to Boston or somewhere with her and they were worried that they would, he would resume seeing Jamie. Did um, the parents seem to want you to report to them on, on what Lyle's activities were? More specifically, Kitty. Okay. Jose didn't ask that many questions. He just wanted to know how Lyle was doing. But Kitty, Kitty wanted, wanted details. Did this put you in an awkward position? Very much so, because sometimes as an adult and as a parent, I felt I had the obligation to really inform them if I saw things that I didn't like, like he was skipping classes, he wasn't studying enough, partying too much, that sort of a thing. But it should have been done on an adult basis, on an information, something that they could act on it. What happened is whenever I did that. OK, let me ask you the next question. <laughs> OK. Did they seem to already know a lot of things that were going on?
Um, I think uh, you were asked, the last question you were asked by Mrs. Bazanich was whether you saw any abuse. <coughs> and your answer was, you asked her, you mean physical abuse. Mm -hmm. And you never witnessed any physical abuse. Is that correct? I never did. But since you seem to highlight physical abuse, did you observe any other behavior that you thought was abusive? Well, children have very fragile minds, and you can inflict a lot of mental abuse on a child, which I think is more devastating. And is that the type of abuse you think you saw? Yes. I'm not going to say that. Any examination on behalf of Sarah? Yes, ma'am. Excuse me. Excuse me. Excuse me. Mrs. Burrell, you were asked uh, by Mrs. Bozanich uh, about Eric as a child, whether he cried a lot. Um, and, and you had indicated you didn't think he particularly cried a lot. Is that correct? Eric had a very sunny disposition. Okay. Now, was, was there a particular activity of his mother's, a particular habit of hers, though, that upset Eric a lot, and you, where you did see him being upset a lot? For example, was she on time when taking him places? Okay. Eric hated to be late. He was paranoid about being late because they were always late. I mean, that was a trademark of Giddy. Or she was always late. And did, did he appear to dislike it because it embarrassed him? What would, you, what would you see her bringing him late to places? To school to swim practice, uh, to soccer games. I remember one day I was supposed to drive, and um, I was driving Eric, and he, the whole trip was, on Terry, if I'm going to be late, I won't go in on Terry. I'm not going to be embarrassed like that again, on Terry. I said, Eric, you're going to be on time. I'm driving you. He said, on Terry, I'm warning you. If I'm late, I'm not going in. I mean, th the whole trip. This is rare on a small child. So he seemed very anxious about being late. Very, very. And yet you saw his mother making him late all the time. Because Kitty was always late. And um, did she try to make up for this by always driving too fast? <coughs> did she always drive too fast? Yes, regardless. Now, during the time when Eric was swimming, you said your daughter, Anna Maria, who is his age, was also swimming? Yes. Uh, was there anything about uh, Eric physically and swimming that you noticed? Well, normally children, when they learn to swim, it's because they can float. Mm -hmm. Eric never had any fat. I mean, he never did. And so for Eric to learn to swim, especially backstroke, or butterfly was extremely, extremely difficult because he couldn't float. And so his had, body would sink? Yes, he would sink or swim the backstroke sitting down. And of course, that was not, we, the, these kids were going to stroke clinics and it was like he couldn't learn. It was nothing, had nothing to do with that. It had to do with the fact that he couldn't float. Did he appear to be physically comfortable with swimming, with being wet? He hated it. How could you tell? Well, take a child, when everybody is practicing, and he spent the whole time pretending to adjust the goggles, body half out, <laughs> shivering, because there was no fat. <laughs> he just so given his physical build, uh, it was quite uncomfortable for him to participate. In yes, he was good at it. But okay, but he did train and practice, and he won some. He would win. He was good. He was good, especially freestyle and breaststroke, because it was a matter, and, and the speed events, never on the long, long distance, because on long distance you do require to float. The speed events, he was strong. He was great. Okay. And he worked hard at it, didn't he? I don't know if he worked at it. He was too cold to really work at it. Okay. Now, 
you've described uh, that you noticed a difference in the relationship between your brother and your sister-in-law after they had moved to California. Yes, I did. Did you know at that time that it was after they moved to California that Kitty discovered Jose's affair? No. Did you know that there had, at the time that you saw them, did either of them mention to you that there had been talk of divorce? No. Uh, Kitty never told you about the affair, is that right? Never. Now you've described um, that in, was it September of 1989, uh, Eric became ill somehow, he had some stomach problem? Um, Eric had severe stomach pains. Had uh, he stopped eating? I really don't remember if he did stop eating. He lost a lot of weight. They both did after Jose and Kitty's death. I mean, like, they shed, like, close to 20 pounds in a week and a half. And, and Eric uh, seemed to have lost a lot of weight as well? It's hard on Eric to see on Eric because he's always so thin. But yes, he didn't look in good shape. And he was with severe stomach pains and then, of course, assumption on our parts, you know, they were in pain. Okay, so you took him, you, you took Eric to the doctor? Yes, I did. And was this the same doctor who had been his pediatrician? Throughout, medicine? since he was six. And that doctor did an examination of him, correct? Yes. Uh, you were asked about the incident at the, uh, at the amusement park. Do you <coughs> recall uh, when Eric refused to go into this yes. attraction? Do you recall his mother calling him a coward in front of you and in front of your girl, Anna Maria? A coward, yes. That word was used. <coughs> yes. Would it be fair to say that you, that you got to know Lyle best uh, after the rest of the family moved to California and he started spending a lot of time alone with you at your house? Yes, that's right. Before the family moved to California, did you ever spend that kind of time alone with Eric? No, I did not. I, he came over, but not, it was not the quality time. And would it be fair to say that most of the time you saw Eric, uh, until his parents died, he was with one or the other of them, or in a sporting activity? Yes, I would say that's correct. After um, your brother and sister-in-law died, did, um, did Eric appear uncomfortable to be at your house? Yes, Eric appeared very uncomfortable to be near the family members. And uh, is this during the period when he never spent more than 24 hours in your house? That is correct. And did that include Christmas of uh, 89? He came, I believe, the 24th <coughs> and left the 25th. I have nothing further. Any recross? Mrs. Baralt? Yes. During the summer of 89, I believe you indicated you were in um, fairly regular telephone contact with your brother, Jose Menendez, is that yes. correct? Yes, yes, I was. Did he ever express during that summer any displeasure with Lyle Menendez? Objection, Your Honor, calls for hearsay, and we reject on 352 grams as well. I think he was upset. He mentioned just once that he was upset uh, about a law having been placed on disciplinary probation. And that was during the summer of 1989? Yes. Okay. I believe you indicated um, on redirect that um, you were talking about having to report to the Menendez parents about Lyle's behavior at Princeton University. And you made reference to partying too much or skipping classes. 
Did that kind of behavior occur? He wasn't partying more so than any other kid, um, but sometimes I knew that he had skipped a class or things like that, and um, I was extremely uncomfortable. I felt, like I said, if somebody sees that on my shell, I want to know, because it's guidance, you know. D did you, in fact, tell um, his parents when he skipped class or when you thought that he was not following the regulations as he should? I did, and I, I got in trouble. Right, and did you do that as in his second semester in 1989 as well? In 89. And that was when you were reporting more? That's when a kitty was calling on a daily basis uh, trying to extract information. Now, I believe that you indicated as well on redirect that your brother had drive and that he pushed himself, that he was relentless. Do you remember saying that? Yes, I did. How old was your brother <coughs> when he came to this country? Sixteen. And do you know where he lived when he got to this country? Yes. Wh he lived in uh, Cunningham, Pennsylvania, which is uh, a suburb of Hazleton, with uh, Carlos's family. Carlos being? My husband. Okay. So, uh, so your parents weren't here at that time, is that correct? My parents were not. And uh, did he have to complete high school at that time? He finished his senior year in high school, graduated from Hazleton uh, High School, and then came to live with us. And then at some point he started college, is that correct? Uh, Carlos's father was a university professor at Southern Illinois, and he arranged for a scholarship for Jose. During the period of time that Jose Menendez was at college, did he also have to work to support himself? Yes, all the time, um, always. And I believe he was about 19 years old when he married uh, Mary Louise Menendez? He was, had just turned 19. <coughs> and then he graduated from college, I believe you indicated, in 64 or 65? It's either 65 or 66. I am not, I don't really remember because this is not a graduation that we all attend. This is something that you do, you work, you get your degree, and not a big deal. Okay. Uh, now, skipping ahead to um, yes. when Lyle was at uh, Princeton University, um, was Lyle an athlete? In other words, did he participate in athletic events at the university, to your knowledge? Lyle was a top tennis player. And did he play <coughs> tennis at Princeton University? Yes, he did. During the year of 1988, do you know where Lyle Menendez was living while he wasn't at Princeton University? I believe he was in Alabama. During the entire year of 1988? Okay, let me get this clear. He's 88, first semester, I believe he was in Alabama, Alabama with Jamie. Um, during the entire year? Don't pin me down to that one. I am. You, you I don't, don't know remember. I okay. don't remember exactly. Mrs. Baralt, you indicated that Eric used to come over to your house. Was that before the family moved to California in 1986? In the year before they moved, like between 85 and 86, would Eric Menendez come to your home? Not as much. By that time, he was almost he was 16 years old. No, not really. Um, in 86, Eric was uh, 15. When they move at 15, and you don't drive there until 17, remember. All right, so how, how far away from the home did you live? I lived 15, 20 minutes by car. Okay. <coughs> now, you indicated that shortly after their parents' deaths that both of the um, defendants lost a substantial amount of weight. Is that correct? Very much so. And I believe you told the juries that they were in a lot of pain. Is that correct? Yes, they were. Did you ever consider that they might be worried about being caught? Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you. I have nothing further. Just briefly, Mrs. Brought, you said that uh, your brother had expressed some concerns about Lyle and being on disciplinary probation. Yes. And was this uh, an incident in which there was some damage done to a pool table at Princeton University? Is that the incident? Uh, yes. But do you know how the damage was done? By cleaning it. They put Clorox to clean, to remove the stains. And of course, of course, the felt faded. And as a result, Lyle was put on disciplinary probation. Lyle was not there. Lyle was asleep. But uh, he was the one who took 
the wrap for it. Thank you. Uh, you were asked by Mrs. Bozanich uh, to describe some aspects of your brother's life when he first came to this country at 16. Yes. Your brother had not been pushed or pressured in your home, had he? Never. In fact, he was totally indulged and spoiled as a child, was he not? Yeah, you could say that. And when he was going to high school, he wasn't being forced to practice tennis six hours a day. No, well, he didn't play tennis. He was a swimmer. Okay, he wasn't being forced to practice swimming. Either. My parents weren't there. Whatever he did, he did because it came <coughs> from his inner drive. Yes. Thank you. I have nothing further. Thank you, Mr. Feller. Excuse me. Thank you, sir. Yeah, you're excused, but you can be called back on uh, notice by uh, the water. Okay. Very good. Thank you. Emmanuel David Slotlow. E M A N U E L D A V I D Z like a zebra L O T O L O W. So. Yes. Okay. Uh, Mr. Burke is putting up a chart which I would like. Uh, Mark Exhibit 200 for identification. It's All right. been shown to the district attorney. That's a chart or a, a map of the streets? Yes, Your Honor. Thank you, Mr. Burt. Mr. Zlatlo, would you take a look at the chart that's been marked Exhibit 200 and see if you recognize yeah, what's I'm on there? Twist a little. I can't see it. Okay, you can here. All right, I got it. Right, there's a pointer over there if you're going to need him to point to anything. Uh, Thank you, Glenn. Can you see it all right from where you are? Yes, ma'am. Okay, here's a pointer if you need it. All right. All right, does this appear to be a, uh, a map of the area in which you live in Beverly Hills? Yes. Okay, and does it show uh, your house at uh, 713 North Maple Drive? Yes. Okay, could you point to your house? And is uh, Zalatlo written in green where your house is? Yes. Okay. Now, are you familiar with Elm Drive in Beverly Hills? Yes. <coughs> and where is Elm Drive in relation to Maple Drive? One block west. It's right there. And between uh, Elm Drive, the, the houses on Elm Drive and Maple Drive, is, is there an alley? Yes. Okay, and is that an alley that is shared by the houses? Yes. Could you point up to the area where the alley is on the map? Right through here. Okay. Are you uh, familiar with 722 North Elm Drive? Yes, vaguely. Okay. And can you see uh, if you can find 722 North Elm Drive on that map and point to it for us? All right. And that's a, a place that has Menendez written on it, correct? Correct. Right, now, getting back to uh, August 20th, 1989, were you at home in the evening? Yes. And where, uh, say between 9 and 11 that evening, where in your home were you? In my bedroom. Okay, and where is your bedroom? Um, located at the rear of the house. Okay. Now, when you say located at the rear of the house, is that... Uh, could you point on the map as to where in your lot your bedroom would be located? Yeah, right about there. Okay, about midpoint in the uh, area? Yeah. Okay. And were you alone or were you with anyone else? I was with some friends. Okay. Who were you with? What are your friends' names? It was uh, my girlfriend and two friends from Las Vegas. Okay. Now, you're... Uh, your bedroom faces in what direction? West, towards the alley. All right. So it faces actually towards the back of Elm Drive, correct? Yes. What were you doing? Uh, you said you were watching TV. Do you remember what you were watching? Yeah, James Bond film. Okay. What was the weather that night, if you remember? I recall that it was warm. Okay. And do you... Uh, 
recall whether or not the windows in your bedroom were open. Definitely they were open, all of them, because it was really hot that day earlier. Okay. Uh, during the time that you were watching the James Bond movie, uh, did you hear anything unusual? Yes. And what did you hear? A series of popping sounds. Uh, were these sounds that, that were quick one after another? Yeah. Okay. And uh, when you heard the popping sounds, were you able to tell what direction they were coming from? Yeah, from up the block. When you say from up the block, what, what, what do you mean? This direction. Okay, so they were... I guess to the northwest. To the northwest of you. Uh, that would be in the direction of uh, Elm Drive. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Now, did you do anything uh, as a result of hearing these sounds? Uh, not immediately, no. Okay. Did you think that... Uh, Objection made. Oh, well, we haven't heard the question yet. Okay. Thank you. Uh, what, what did you think the sounds were when you heard them that evening? I didn't really think about it, but it could have been firecrackers. could have been really anything. The next morning, uh, did you come to find out about some unusual activity in the neighborhood? Yes. Okay, and what was that? Um, I heard uh, on the TV that there was a, a mafia hit on Elm Drive, something like this. Okay. Did you see anything in your neighborhood that was unusual? Uh, did you see police? Yes, I saw police. Okay. Um, and that was in the area of 722 North Elm Drive. Yeah, and in the alley. They were all over the place. Okay. Thank you very much. I have nothing further. Cross examination. Thank you. Mr. Zalatlo, is that yes. close in pronunciation? Close? Good enough. Okay. Um, were you in your bedroom or were you in the guest house or are those one and the same? Um, I was in my bedroom. Is there also a guest house on the property? Yes. Um, did you ever tell anyone that you had been in the guest house at the time that you heard these noises? Well, at the time, I was living in the bedroom, but now I live in the guest house. I moved. It's right. at the back of the property. Okay, so the guest house is closer to the alley than your bedroom, is that correct? It's right on the alley, yeah. Okay. And so that would have been at the back of the property versus the middle of the property? Correct. And so it's your present recollection then that on the night that you heard these noises, you weren't in the guest house, but you were in your bedroom inside of the main house? Yes. And you were what? You had a television inside your bedroom? Yes. And I believe it's your testimony that you and your girlfriend and two friends of yours from Las Vegas were watching a James Bond movie. Yes, that's true. Okay. Do you remember which James Bond movie it was? Um, I, they said it was The Spy Who Loved Me. They should have it in the TV guide. Okay, do you have a specific memory of watching it, or are you just repeating something that you may have learned recently? No, I was watching the film. All right, and do you remember at what point during the film it was that you um, heard these noises? In other words, had the movie started? Was it finished? Where was it? Somewhere in the middle of the film. Okay. Um, did you make any attempt at the time that you heard the noises to um, try to see what time it was? No. Okay. Um, how long have, had you lived in that neighborhood as of August the 20th of 89? I think that would be 13 years. Okay. Um, during the summer, and especially around the 4th of July, had you ever heard firecrackers in your neighborhood? Yes. And do you have any memory of whether that summer you had heard firecrackers around the 4th of July? Not specifically. Now, when you said you heard poppy noises, could you tell us about how many noises you heard? I've gone over it in my head many times, and I'm going to say it's like seven or eight. There was a couple, and then a short gap and then a couple more. All right, so when you're saying a couple, you mean more than two then? Yes. And so you heard some noises and then you heard a break in the noises. Is that correct? Yeah, like a pause. All right, and then you heard some more noises. Is that correct? Yes. All right, Oop. and I take it that at the time you had an opinion about what those noises were. Yeah, I guess. I, at the time I heard them, I thought probably it was firecrackers. It sounded like it could have been a string of firecrackers going off. And so what did you do in regards to hearing those noises? Did you call the police? No. Did any of the people that you were watching the movie with call the police? 
No, but we all heard it. All and right. we discussed it. It was uh, <clears throat> after we went to the beach that day and okay. everybody was tired. Okay, wait. I, mm, you, sorry. You really can't testify to what other people say. Um, what, all I, right. what I asked you is whether or not you called the police. No. All right. And so, uh, but you did um, note with the, the other people in the room with you watching the movie appeared to perk up and listen. Would that be correct to say? Yes. Okay. Now, I believe you indicated that it was a very hot day that day, and, the, and therefore all the windows in your bedroom were open? Yes. How many windows did you have in your bedroom? Um, well, this is my bedroom, and then there was like an adjoining room, and the adjoining room was like all windows. We've since remodeled the house. It's no longer like that, but uh, I'd say five or six windows. And so all of the available windows in those two areas were open? Yes. Did you hear any other noises, uh, loud noises that night prior to hearing the popping noises? You have to say out loud. Oh, no. All right, court reporter can't take it down when you raise oh, your head. Um, now, the two defendants who are here in court, Lyle and Eric Menendez, did you know them personally as of the 20th of August of 1989? No. And you'd never seen them before? No. Had you ever heard any other noises coming from the direction that were distinctive, the same direction that you've told us about? within the month prior to the poppy noise. I'd say no. May I have a moment, please? Oh, I have a, uh, yes, I have a couple more questions. Have you at one time described these noises as being somewhat muffled? Yeah. Is be. that correct, that they were muffled? Yeah. Thank you. I have nothing further. Maybe direct. Just very briefly, Your Honor. Uh, Mr. Zalatlo, you live in this house with your parents, correct? Yes. Okay. Or you lived there with your parents back in 1989? Yes. And when you describe, you say the word muffled, uh, what do you mean? She, she used the word. I okay. Uh, but you said that they were muffled sounds. Were they? Yes. Okay, and, and what does that mean? Well, I guess you'd really have to play a bunch of sounds and compare them. It's kind of complicated to explain, but uh, there's clear, sharp sounds, and then there are other sounds that aren't so clear. And muffled could mean anything in between those two points. Okay, so they were sounds that you heard at some distance. Yes. And you said that there were about seven or eight pops that you remember hearing? Yes. And that's obviously uh, your best guess at this point, right? Yes. Okay. And you said that you heard two and there was a short gap? I heard a, f a few. It could have been three, could have been four. Okay. Was that a gap of like seconds? Um, maybe a second, second and a half. So it was very short? Yeah, short gap. All right, thank you. I have nothing further. Any recross? Yeah. All right, thank you. May step down. You're excused. Thank you. Yes, yes I'm sorry. Left. Yes. Uh, did you hear anything unusual as you sat in bed that night reading? Well, I didn't sit. I was lying in bed and I was reading. And uh, at almost, it seemed to me, exactly 10 o'clock, I heard pop, 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 pop. And I thought, what kids in the neighborhood are lighting firecrackers this time of night on a Sunday night? Okay. Now, you've said that it was almost exactly at 10 o'clock. Yes. What makes you say that? Because I have a clock right next to my bed. Okay. And and I looked is, at it. All right. So you looked at the clock and remember seeing 10 o'clock. Yes. Okay. Uh, Mrs. Lord, excuse me, but do, do you have any hearing problems? Yes, I do have hearing problems, corrected by hearing aids. Okay, and when you were in bed reading on August 20th at about 10 o'clock, were you wearing your yes, hearing aids? Yes, I was. Mm -hmm. okay. And you described the noise as pops? It sounded to me like firecrackers, pops, yes. Okay, and uh, these were a, a number of pops that uh, you heard a regular week. pop, 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 and I can't tell you how many. I never counted them, of course. Okay. If um, anyone, if, if those noises that you heard were to be described as a boom, would that be c 
accurate or inaccurate in terms I of what you've heard? I think that's inaccurate. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. I have nothing further. Cross examination. That's okay. We're, we're shifting. Mrs. Lord, how long have you lived in that neighborhood? I've lived in that house 33 years. And I lived in another house on the street before that. All right, so you've lived in that house for 33 years? Is that yes? That's how I know about firecrackers, because my children used to light them once in a while. Okay, so prior to um, August the 20th of 1989, you had heard firecrackers in your neighborhood, hadn't you? Prior to that time? Yeah, prior to the night oh, you heard yes. the noises. Uh -huh. um, in spite of the fact that it's Beverly Hills, do people set off firecrackers sometimes, like for the 4th of July? Uh, well, actually, sometimes there are firecrackers on the 4th of July, and sometimes, I mean, in our area, and sometimes not. Okay. Now, when you heard the noises, did they appear to come all at the same time, or was there any pause in any of the shots that you As I said, they were irregular, but as far as four years ago, I couldn't tell you exactly. Have you ever met either of the two defendants who are here in court? I've never seen them before in my life, no. And after you heard these noises uh, that night, did you call the police? No, because I thought there were firecrackers and they stopped, so I continued reading. Okay. Uh, did you hear any other noises before you heard the firecrackers? Nothing. Nothing. Thank you. I have nothing further. Anything else? No additional questions. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. You're thank excused. You. Thanks for coming in. Thank you. Well, let us, let us do that then rather than have further discussion. Just have her testify and see All right. if we can proceed that way. Face the court clerk, please, over here, and she'll give you the oath. Pamela Lisa Lacazzi. My last name is spelled L I. Capital C A U S I. Ms. Lacasse, did you work for uh, an individual named Richard Klein back in 1987? Yes. And did Richard Klein had a group called Internet Intercontinental Group? Was yes. that the name of the business? Yes, it was. What was your role in that business? I was the executive assistant, secretarial, among other things. And what were your duties and responsibilities? Um, I interacted with the clients, um, and I also helped get new clients. Um, basically, I did everything uh, from secretarial computers, took care of um, flight arrangements, arranged meetings, and was involved with all meetings, all planning. And how many employees were involved in Mr. Klein's group? <laughs> There was about nine of us. And did you, on a certain date, uh, come to know a person named El Jerome Ozeal? Yes. Could you tell us how you came to know him? Well, when I first started working there, like the first day, uh, Richard mentioned that uh, this was his friend, but also a psychiatrist, too, and uh, that he would be calling in and to always take his phone calls, and um, that I would be seeing this particular person often. And did you, in fact, come to see him often? Yes, I did. Did you see him uh, in person? 
Yes. And also talked to him numerous times on the telephone? Yes. Did you see him interacting with your boss, Mr. Klein? Yes. And could you tell us how frequently you saw that take place? So frequently I couldn't even count. I mean, it was like a everyday occurrence or every other a day. And would you personally attend meetings where Dr. Ozio was present with your boss? Yes. And how frequently would that take place? Meetings, maybe once a week, formal meetings. And would these meetings involve Dr. Ozeal interacting with other people beside Richard Klein? Yes. Who would he be <laughs> interacting with that you were able to observe? Um, there was a man named Jeff Seaman, Gina Zakia, um, another fellow named Jeff, I can't recall his last name, Todd Marshall. Um, those are the only ones I can recall right now. And for what period of time did you have this contact with Dr. Ozeal? For almost a year. So in 1987 is when it began and then you worked there for approximately a year? Yes. And during that whole period of time was your contact with Dr. Ozeal on a frequent basis? Yes. And did he actually have a space there in your office? Yes, when they started the new business, not at first, when they started the new Automax business. Automax was a business that Richard Klein and Dr. Ozeal had formed together? Well, Richard came up with the concept and then, um, then Mr. Ozeal came in after that. And Mr. Ozeal actually moved into the office? Um, he didn't, he still kept his other private office in Beverly Hills because he is a psychiatrist, but they were, the people that were involved with Automax were saying, you have to cut ties with all of that if you're going to totally come on board here. So for a while he had two things going and uh, there was a little squabbling in regards to that. And uh, finally they made some kind of contract where he'd get more money than he thought he was gonna get. And then he went ahead and said, okay, he left his patients. Then he actually came into your office. Yes. And during the time after and even before that he came into your office, did you he see him in situations where he would make statements to certain people and then directly contradictory statements to other people? Yes. And did that occur frequently? All the time. And did there come a time when your boss, uh, Richard Klein, was hospitalized? Yes. Was that in 1988? Yes. And after he was hospitalized, did uh, after he got out of the hospital, was he uh, forced out of his office by uh, Jerry Ozeal? During the period that Richard was in the hospital, gave Jerry Ozeal more opportunity to backstab him, um, to play him down to say bad things about Richard. He got more manipulating control over the whole situation, totally bad-mouthed Richard, and he's supposedly his best friend and his psychiatrist. And you were in the office observing this take place while your boss was in the hospital, right. correct? Now, after your boss got out of the hospital, did uh, Mr. Ozeal remain with Richard Klein in the same office, or was, it, was there a parting of the ways? There was a parting of the ways. Um, Everything was kind of hectic. Uh, the excuse, Jerry had turned almost everyone against Richard, all of his employees that he had for a long time. And the excuse that they gave was that the Automax was going to become so big that this particular building we were in wasn't going to be able to fit everyone. So they went and found another location. And did Dr. Ozeal take a certain number of Richard Klein's employees with him? Yes, he did. And did you continue to communicate with those employees who you had worked with previously yes. about Dr. Ozeal's <clears throat> exploits? Yes. And did you continue to communicate with <clears throat> Richard Klein uh, about Dr. Ozeal and his involvement with your boss right up until last year when your boss died? Yes. And based on that length of time, did you form an opinion Dr. Ozeal's character for honesty or lack thereof? Yes, I have. My opinion, after working with him for one year and seeing how he acted, my opinion about Dr. Ozeal is that he is greedy, malicious, um, deceitful. He preys, manipulates, and brainwashes vulnerable people. He has no ethics, uh, no morals. He's a professional liar. 
Um, he makes uh, David Koresh look like a saint. He's scary. He really scares me. And would it be fair to say, based on what you just said, that your opinion is that he is a dishonest person? Very dishonest. And do you also, based on your contact with him and talking to other people who know him within his circle of friends, are you able to testify what his reputation is for honesty or the lack of honesty in his business circle of friends? Yes, I'm able to do that. What is his reputation? His uh, reputation is one for being a snake, you know, um, backstabber, liar. Can't trust him. Thank you. That's all I have. I will give you offer of proof. Cross-examination? Yes. Yes. With whom have you spoken about Dr. Ozil's reputation? Pardon me? With whom have you spoken about Dr. Ozil's reputation for these um, character traits that you've just told us about? Um, Richard Klein. Who else? Uh, Gina Zakia. This other person named Jeff that I can't recall his last name. Um, there was Karen. Were these all people that were involved in Mr. Klein's original business? Yes. Okay. And um, at some point, Mr. Klein's original business, did it fall apart or did it go broke or what happened to well, it? Well, the tax laws changed and um, there, you couldn't get the same kind of tax benefit for equipment leasing. So they went on to other ventures. But what happened to the business that, that you were originally hired to work for? Well, it was still ongoing because we still had clients involved and you couldn't just stop it. You, you know, we had to wrap things up and still to this day, some people do get involved, but the tax benefit is not as great as it used to be. Did the business began, begin to lose money after the tax laws changed? Yeah, it wasn't as profitable. Okay, did it begin to lose money though? There's a difference between making a profit. I wasn't involved with the accounting department, so I wouldn't be able to tell you exactly yes or no. Now, the people that you then have spoken to um, about uh, Dr. Ozil's reputation for honesty are all people who were originally involved with you and Mr. Klein in this business of his. Yes. Okay. And you haven't spoken to anyone outside of this particular business, is that correct? I hate, well, I've seen the TV and yeah, I've discussed it. When I first saw this on TV, I was shocked when I found out Jerry Ozil was the uh, physician for these boys because I thought, <gasps> oh, those poor guys because I know how he is. All right, but you haven't spoken to anyone else about his reputation. Anybody yes, else? I have. Well, are people who know him? No. All right, so the only people that you've spoken to about his reputation who knew him were these people that you've listed, Richard Klein, Gina, Zakia, Jeff, and Karen. Also, um, Elmer and Helen Klein, Richard's parents. Now, Mr. Klein had a drinking problem, is that correct? Yes, he did. And when he was hospitalized, was that, that was for hepatitis, correct? Uh, yes. Which is a liver ailment. Yes. Okay. And um, now the, the business that you originally were hired to work for, um, you said there were nine employees. Were those employees that you, Approximately. Were those employees that you supervised? Um, no, actually everybody had their own job. All right, and then after the tax law changed and the business became less profitable, it was at that time that Mr. Klein and Dr. Ozil went into the Automax business, is that correct? Not at the exact time. The tax laws had changed in the previous year, and they were still working with people. You couldn't just cut people off like that. Um, so business was still going on, and then they created Automax at the same time. Okay. Was Automax ever a profitable business? Yes. <laughs> And uh, did Mr. Klein share in those profits? I never saw him, you know, get handed a check or anything, but I would assume so, yes. Okay. Now, after <coughs> you indicated that um, when Mr. Klein went to the hospital, that it was at that time that Dr. Ozil um, forced him out. Could you explain exactly how that occurred? <coughs> While Richard was in the hospital, um, I was going back and forth to the hospital, but uh, Jerry would uh, say bad things about Richard, and he would start getting everybody on uh, Richard's, on uh, Jerry's side, talking about what a, can I say profanities? Oh, saying There's he was no an ass. to do that, though. Okay. No. All right. He would say awful things about him and turning all the other employees against Richard, and Richard's totally defenseless in the hospital. And by the time Richard got out of the hospital, boom, Jerry had already convinced everybody to uh, move into this other place, so. At, at that time, was Mr. Klein then forced out of Automax? 
pushed out, yeah. All right. Now, was he a good businessman, Mr. Klein? Absolutely. Uh, how often would he show up at work inebriated? Uh, oh, um, I don't know. Was Usually at the end of the day is when it seemed like he would have a cocktail, have wine or something. Was he inebriated almost every day at work? Frequently. I wouldn't say every day. Okay. And um, when you left, why is it you left? Um, I, it was just everything was too much. I, I mean, I was like Richard's confidant. I was his, almost his mother, his secretary, his psychiatrist. I mean, I just took care of everything. And when he was in the hospital, his parents came out for like three weeks. I went out to dinner with them every single night. Just got to the point where I was, there was too much. It was too much for me to handle. I mean, trying to protect this man against Jerry, actually. I was just, I was turning into uh, like that codependent type thing. I thought, uh-uh. All right, so you, you left because Mr. Klein was basically too needy. Wouldn't that be fair to say? Yeah, well, and, just the pressure was too much. And so you, you at that time were protecting him, is that correct? Yes, that's just the way I am with all my friends and family and people I care about. But he, he was your employer? Yes. And how old a person was he during this period of time? How old was he? Yeah. About 45. Okay, thank you. During the time that you knew Dr. Ozeo, he never hit on you sexually? No. You're not? Well, he kind of flirtatious, though. But tried to be. You're not in the category of a jilted lover who has no. a grudge against Dr. Ozeo? Mm -mm. No. Never slept with him, right? Absolutely now. not. Thank you. All right, anything else? No, no. Okay, you may step down. Um, can we find out if our jurors are all here? Um, Gold is present. Okay. And I believe blue is present, but one is outside. Okay. All right, then. Um, are we ready to proceed, then, with the um, testimony of the next witnesses? Yes. yes. All right, then. Let's get both juries in, and we'll proceed. In the trial, we have now both juries present, uh, as well as all the other participants in the trial. Uh, good morning to you all. And we're ready to resume with the uh, trial. The defense may call its next witness. Thank you. We've got Lisa Lacazzi. My name is Pamela Lisa Lacazzi. My last name is spelt L-I, capital C, A-U-S-I. Good morning. Can you tell the juries where you reside? I live on 1000. And were you living in Los Angeles back in 1987 and 1988? Yes, I was. Where were you working at that time? A place called Intercontinental Group. And what is Intercontinental Group? It's an equipment leasing firm. And what did you do in the company? I was the executive assistant secretarial. And who was your boss? Richard Klein. And could you tell the juries what you did for Mr. Klein? Basically, I interacted with all of the investors. Um, I did secretarial work, computers, <coughs> among other things. I took care of uh, making plans, meetings, attended meetings. And you would actually physically be present at his meetings? Yes, I would. How many people were employed by Intercontinental Group? Approximately nine. And did you have contact with those nine people as well as Mr. Klein? Yes. Did you have occasion in approximately early 1987 to meet a person named L. Jerome Ozeal? Yes. And do you know if Mr. Ozeal knew Richard Klein? Yes. Do you know how they knew each other? Yes. How did they know each other? They knew each other. Uh, Jerry Ozeal used to be, his, or was his psychiatrist, then became his friend, then became his best friend, then became a business partner. Objection sustained. The answer is stricken. Well, do you know, without telling you what someone else told you, based on your own personal observation of seeing Mr. Klein and Mr. Ozeal interact, what their relationship was? Yes. What was it? Before, at one time, he was strictly his psychiatrist and friend, and then all of a sudden he became a business partner too. And you know that because you were conducting Mr. Klein's business? Exactly. And 
were you also arranging uh, through telephone or otherwise meetings between Mr. Ozeal yes. and Richard Klein? Yes. And can you give us your best estimation of when it was that you first came into contact with Mr. Ozeal? First day I ever worked there. Which was when? It was April 3rd, 1987, or April 4th, 1987. And what was the business, if there was one, that Mr. Klein and Mr. Ozeo were involved in? They wanted to start a sort of credit card business called Automax. A credit card business? Just very br briefly, do you know the nature of the business without getting into details? They would uh, make a credit card that you could use to purchase vehicles, to rent vehicles, parts for vehicles, and then they wanted to expand even greater where you could almost like get your hair done or something with your credit card. They wanted to conquer the world with this particular credit card. And if you know, whose business idea was that? Richard Klein's. And did Mr. Ozeal come into the picture after Mr. Klein conceived of that business idea? Yes, he did. And did Mr. Ozeal in fact move in to the office that Richard Klein had at that time? Yes, but he continued to ha still have his other office in Beverly Hills. But he had a <coughs> space in your office as well? Yes. And how frequently would you interact with Mr. Ozeal during the period of time that you were working there? Um, I would talk to him every day almost on the telephone and at first and he would come in like once a week. Then when the Automax business got started, every single day. And would that interaction include phone contact as well as seeing him in person? Yes. And when you saw him in person, could you describe for the jury the situations just in general where you would interact with him in person? Basically, he'd come to, or he'd be in the office and we'd be having meetings and stuff. Uh, sometimes all of us were not there. Um, there'd be times when Richard would be handling a phone call in his office and Jerry would start saying bad things about Richard. Um, and I would just say, wait okay, a minute. You well, wait a minute. answer the question. Okay. You don't actually be on the question. So the last part of the answer about what was said by Mr. Oziel is strict. But my uh, question was, what kinds of situations would you see them interact with? You mentioned business meetings. Correct? Business meetings, and lunches. And you would be personally present at these business meetings and luncheons? Yes. Were there situations where you would be with Mr. Ozeal and Mr. Klein and other people and you would hear Mr. Ozeal make certain statements without getting into what the statements were? Yes. And then did you, outside the presence of Mr. Klein, hear him make directly contrary statements? Yes. And did you also hear him make similar contradictory statements about other employees that you were working with and Mr. Ozeal was interacting with. Okay, Council, we're going beyond uh, the offer here. Right. Over what period of time did you interact with Mr. Ozeal where you were seeing him make statements both in and outside the presence of your boss, Mr. Ten to eleven months, constantly. And did you also have occasion to see Mr. Ozeal inter interact with other office staff besides Mr. Klein? Yes. And did there come a time when your boss was hospitalized? Yes. And do you know just roughly the time period when that happened? I have it in my notes. Um, I write everything on my calendar. Basically, it was probably eight months into when I was working there. And while your boss was hospitalized, did you have occasion to see Jerry Ozeal operate in the business that you were involved in? Yes. And did you see him operate with other employees in the absence of your boss? Yes. And after your boss got out of the hospital, did Mr. Klein and Mr. Ozeal separate business-wise? They started separation. And did Mr. Ozeal take a certain number of employees who formerly worked for Mr. Klein and go somewhere else? Yes. And did you continue to interact with those former employees that Mr. Ozeal took with him? Here's yes. We'll Overall, the answer will stand. And did you continue to interact with Mr. Klein specifically about Dr. Ozeal? Yes. And did you continue to interact with Mr. Klein right up to his death in 1992 concerning Mr. Ozeal? 
Not exactly up until his death. I about All right, a year you've before. you've answered the question. Shortly before his death. Yes. All right. And based on your contact with Mr. Ozeal during the period of time that you were involved with him and your observation of him in various situations, do you have an opinion as to his honesty or the lack thereof? Yes. Could you tell the juries what your opinion is about his honesty or his lack of honesty? He is extremely dishonest. Thank you very much. All right, cross-examination. Ms. McCausey, um, you were very loyal to Mr. Klein, is that correct? Yes. And um, Mr. Klein and Dr. Ozeal had a business falling out, wouldn't that be fair to say? Yes. And did Mr. Klein have a drinking problem? Yes. And was he almost always inebriated during the time that you worked for him? Frequently. Um, did you give an interview um, to the defense investigator in this case? Yes. Would it refresh your recollection to look at that to see the frequency with which Mr. Klein was inebriated? Overall. May I approach please? Well, first of all, the question was, would it refresh your memory? Okay. Yes. Now, did you tell the defense investigators that Richard Klein was almost always inebriated? I meant frequently. Okay, not almost always. Yes. Um, were you present in Dr. Ozeal's office on the night of October the 31st of 1989? And the basis of the objection, beyond the scope of direct examination. Sustained. Thank you. All right, anything else? Yes. You said um, <coughs> you had a certain amount of loyalty to Mr. Klein? Yes. And you said he was inebriated? Was he a good businessman? Yes, he was. And did you think he was vulnerable? Absolutely. Did you think Dr. Ozeal took advantage of him? Without a doubt. Objection sustained. The answer is stricken. Did you, in addition to see, seeing Dr. Ozeal interact with your boss who was inebriated, also see him inter interact with several other people within your business? Yes. Is your opinion about his extreme dishonesty based solely on what you saw between Dr. Ozeal and your boss? No. Objection beyond the scope of describe. Overall, that answer will stand. And could you explain why it's not based just on that opinion? Objection irrelevant. Just on that? Objection sustained. Interaction. Objection sustained. <coughs> Under Section 352 of the Evidence Code right. as well. Could you explain to the jury why you had a certain loyalty to Mr. Klein? Objection irrelevant. Sustained. That's all I have to say. All right, anything else? No. All right, you may sit down. Thank you. Thank you. The whole truth and nothing but the truth, I have to do. Be seated. Tell us your full name about your last. My name is Janet Sorg Stoltzfus, S-T-O-L-T, Z as in zebra, F as in fox, U, S as in Sam. Okay. Mrs. Stoltzfus, what is your occupation? I'm a teacher. And, uh, where do you teach? I teach at Princeton Day School in um, Princeton, New Jersey. And is Princeton Day School also known as PDS? Yes, it is. And how long... Uh, have you been teaching at Princeton Day School? I taught there from 1978 to 1986 and then spent four years in London and returned three years ago, so I'm beginning my fourth year back. And how long have you been a teacher? I started teaching um, after I graduated from college. I did a year of graduate work. I taught at the Beirut College for Women in Beirut, Lebanon. I taught overseas. My husband and I lived overseas in the Middle East for about 20 years. He was in the Foreign Service. And uh, on and off between raising five children, I taught whenever I had the opportunity. 
Now, specifically directing your attention to uh, 19, the fall of 1985 to the spring of 1986, you were then teaching at PDS, correct? I was. Mm -hmm. And uh, did you have a class uh, in which you had Eric Menendez as one of your students? Yes, I did. He was in my ninth grade Bible class. Okay. Now, what, tell us what kind of a, a class the ninth grade Bible class is. I should preface by saying that uh, religion is a, a year of religion is a requirement at our school. We are not a religious school, we are a secular school, but it is regarded as important. And kids have the option of taking Bible in ninth or tenth grade or uh, electives as juniors or seniors. The Bible course was described as Bible as a basis of Western civilization and it was a way of looking at the Judeo-Christian tradition. Now, uh, this was a year-long course year -long. that you taught, and how many times a week did uh, you meet? We met four times a week. And that was for how long a day? Well, it varies from one day to the other. Um, our schedule is very hard to understand, but let's say average 50-minute periods. Okay. And about how many other children were in the ninth grade Bible class that we're speaking of? In that section, I'd guess, 15 or 16. Now, can you tell us, Mrs. Stoltis, uh, based on your contact with Eric uh, during, I'm sorry, Mrs. Abramson can't hear me. Um, can you tell us, based on your contact with uh, Eric during the course of this year, uh, whether he was mature for his age? He would have been 15 and something, right. I think. Um, immature compared to the others. Okay. And is there anything uh, in particular about his behavior in class with respect to you uh, that um, makes you uh, tell us that he was immature compared to the other children? Some of the behavior, sort of clowning, uh, which some kids do but uh, is not necessarily seen as mature behavior. We met uh, with the, the building in which our class met is an old building and we met in the dining room of the building. It was not like a regular classroom and it had a big table and we all sat around the table, and Eric always sat right there um, for whatever reason. He seemed to want to feel secure. Okay, when you say right there, do you mean next to Right you? next to me. Mm -hmm. Okay, and uh, is, is it your, is it, did that to you mean that, that Eric felt some need to be near you? What, what uh, based on your years of teaching experience, uh, is there a particular phenomenon that is at work when a child seeks to be near a teacher, to be close to a teacher? Sustain. I am going to show you, Mrs. Stolfus package of documents that's been previously marked as Exhibit 197, which the prosecution has had for a number of days. May I approach on it? Yes. Thank you. I'll show you a package of documents. Would you take a look at those and uh, see if you recognize? <coughs> These are comments written by various teachers. I see a lot of middle school reports. Um, there are some uh, tabs oh, all on right. the side of the paper. Uh, would you look at those tabs and, and see whether or not those tabs show your <coughs> Yes, uh, comment from the, um, from probably October of 85, comment from uh, November of 85, comment from um, March, probably, of, of uh, 86, and um, 
sir. Last comment appears to be from June of 1986. Yes, I'm just catching up with uh, March and April. The last one would be June of 1986. Now, what are these comments that uh, we've been referring to? Every quarter, and in this case, I notice there are five, which we no longer have to do. Thank goodness, only four. Um, at the time that you give grades, you also write a comment assessing the student, uh, a trying to give a verbal picture of where the student is at that point, making suggestions for improvement or praise for success. And have you had a chance to review your comments about Eric that you wrote in connection with the Bible class? Yes, I have. Now, Mrs. Stolfus, did uh, you notice uh, any learning problems that Eric had early on in your contact with him uh, in 1985? I recall saying in that very first comment in October that I noticed he seemed to get flustered uh, taking written tests and that it was my observation that uh, he had a problem literally with the physical act of writing. Uh, it's a fancy term for it, is dysgraphia. Uh, he would have had to have been tested for that, which as far as I know he never was but that his writing was quite bad and it was literally painful to do it and I concluded that perhaps one of the reasons that he particularly got disturbed uh, at the time of taking a test was because of that. Okay. Right, I need to strike everything after I conclude this being a speculation and conclusion from the Right, that portion, portion of the answer will be stricken, the rest will remain. Now, let's get back to this, uh, the term that you said, dysgraphia. Mm -hmm. Okay, and that is uh, literally a, a difficulty in putting, putting your thoughts to paper. Right, and in actually physically writing on the page. Okay. Uh, was there a difference uh, between uh, the skills that you observed Eric uh, using in class orally and his written skills. Very striking difference. He was excellent in oral discussion. Uh, he had a lot of wonderful insights and he expressed himself very well. Okay, now you, you mentioned uh, that your first comment uh, was that he became flustered on tests. C can you tell us what you meant by flustered? Well, to me, flustered is sort of sweating a lot and scratching things out and having trouble concentrating while others are moving right along and perhaps not even finishing. Uh, did it appear to you that Eric uh, was a child with, with a high anxiety level with respect to his performance in school? I would say he was very anxious. Okay. And uh, is there anything else about his uh, behavior in class uh, that uh, makes you conclude that he was anxious, for example, his seating himself. That would certainly uh, be an example of it um, because a girl might do that, but it's unusual for a guy. Um, and the security, if you're taking a test and you're anxious, uh, would certainly lead to that. Um, being very worried about whether the assignment had been done right, taking a test and saying, Am I doing this right? Uh, and say, so, you know, we can't talk about that now. That kind of thing. He, he, he would say that. He would say, am I doing this right mm -hmm. during tests? Mm -hmm. Is that yes? Yes. Okay. And of course, that's something that students are taught they're not allowed to do during the course of the test. They, they try from time to time, but uh, he was much more chronic about it. Okay. Now, Mrs. Stolfitz, did Eric seem to you to be a happy child or a sad child? Eric struck me as a very sad kid. I never saw what I would call a sense of joy about him. All right. You mentioned um, earlier that, that he was, uh, he used to clown around. Mm -hmm. uh, how, how do you reconcile your description of him as a sad kid with his clowning around behavior? I would conclude that the clowning around was to get attention to show that he was one of the kids when in fact he had as far as I could see no particular buddies 
in that classroom. Okay. Um, he didn't appear to, to have uh, friends that he would talk to or spend time with <coughs> during class, no particular friends? No. Did he seem to be lonely? Overall. He was a very alone kind of person, yes. Now, Mrs. Stolfus, have you uh, had a chance to review at some prior time the <coughs> comments that were written about Eric by uh, other teachers at Princeton Day School? At the time that I looked over my old ones, I also looked at comments written by my son and by other teachers. Uh, my son also teaches there. And I was struck by how often teachers referred to his anxiety. Uh, did uh, there appear to be any uh, pressure on Eric with respect to uh, learning a performance in school? Yes. And do you, uh, what, what do you mean when you say there appeared to be pressure? He would get very uptight at the time of a test and over deadlines. Were you aware, Mrs. Stoltis, that uh, Eric had an older brother named Lyle who attended PDS? Yes, I was. And uh, are you uh, aware of uh, how Lyle did as a student <coughs> as compared to Eric? Sustained. What was, uh, was there discussion among the teachers at PDS uh, about uh, the two uh, Menendez boys and their, I'm sorry. and their level of achievement? Sustained. Did Eric appear to be under any pressure because of his following in his brother's footsteps? I would say absolutely. Okay, and uh, was his brother a, a better student or a worse student? <coughs> I never taught Lyle. The conventional wisdom was... Yeah, that would be your Sustained. Uh, was there any discussion among the teachers at school uh, about Lyle? Lyle's academic achievement? What, was that a matter that was discussed? At faculty meetings, one discusses students, uh, and Lyle was regarded as the more achieving student. Your Honor, I can just that as Sustain the answer straight. Okay. Was there any source of pressure uh, on Eric uh, in terms of performing at school uh, aside from? Uh, was there, were sports a source of pressure? He played on the tennis team in the spring. He certainly uh, put a lot of time into practice. One of my comments, I warn him because he had had a marvelous uh, second quarter and then the third quarter began to slip slide away a little bit and I said, you know, um, be sure you don't let the pressures of the tennis season get in the way of your academics. Was that in your uh, comment? That was in my comment, In yes. April of 1986? That's correct. And mm -hmm. was that a comment that was written actually before the tennis season even began? Probably on the verge of it. Okay, did... Um, Probably would have started. Okay. And did, in fact, uh, once the tennis season started, did Eric appear to, to have some uh, added pressure on him uh, because of his involvement in tennis? His performance <laughs> diminished. Um, did Eric ever mention to you uh, Lyle's superior uh, performance or uh, reputation as an, an achiever in school? L uh, Eric made it very clear that he idolized his older brother, that this was somebody who was an academic wonder and an athlete of the first order. Did Eric indicate to you that he uh, wanted to emulate his older brother. It was very clear that he would love to achieve as his brother had. Right, Mrs. Stolfus, did there come a time uh, in the spring of 1986, uh, probably at around the time during tennis season, uh, where you caught Eric, Eric copying from another child's work. Yes. And uh, how, how did you happen to find out that Eric copied from another child's work? I had given a rather long written assignment 
uh, actually to outline the Book of Acts. And uh, they had been turned in, and I was reading them, read Eric's, thought this looks good, uh, put it aside, read some others, read another one, and realized that I was seeing words again that I had read earlier. So then I set them out side by side, and it was clear that one was a copy of the other, and the other student was a straight one student, and Eric had been floundering. Uh, it was clear that he had copied from the other student. And a straight one student is somebody that gets the highest That's grade. right. We have a very bizarre grading system. Okay, so straight one would be like an A? Beyond. Okay. Now, after you uh, made this discovery, did you then talk to Eric? About yes, him? I did. And uh, I called him aside, a uh, little room we had up in Cole Ross. This building that we taught in, which was not the main building, I'm sorry. And I said, I showed the papers and I said, you cheated. You copied this. How do you explain this? I may not have attacked like that. I don't exactly remember. But I said, how do you explain the similarity between these two? And his initial reaction was, you know, nothing. And then I said, you had to have copied this. And he began to cry. You say he began to cry. Yes. Uh, a few tears? No, he really cried. Okay. Was uh, the crying that you saw uh, unusual behavior for a 15 or 16 year old ninth grader, even one who's just been confronted with a paper they copied? I. I have rarely seen a boy of that age cry over anything. Okay. And did um, <coughs> Eric tell you anything about um, why he copied the other child's paper? He was desperate to get it done. Now, meaning he, he had to get it in by a certain time? Had to be in by a certain time, and I had made that very clear, and okay. because I was away at the time. Uh, Mrs. Stolfus, you had at that point taught Eric uh, since the fall, mm -hmm. correct? Is that yes? Yes, that is correct. And um, Eric, what, could Eric have, have gotten more time to complete the assignment if he had asked you? Yes, he could have. I often gave extensions. He didn't seem to trust what the other kids knew about me, that I would give an extension. Overall, the answer will stand. Was um, this copying of the other child's paper a particularly clever or sophisticated way of... Doomed to failure. Totally unsophisticated. Did Eric um, ever have the, a problem uh, following uh, instructions that you not noticed? Yes, uh, often, and this was one of the things that would get him into trouble on a test, uh, he would misread the directions and, or on a creative, creative kind of assignment, I gave a lot of creative type of assignments, he would either misread the directions or not follow them, even if sometimes one had gone over them in class. And did you uh, in fact, mention uh, these problems in following instructions in the comments. Yes, I did. Mm -hmm. Let me ask you, Mrs. Stolfus, did any uh, one ever con did any either Mr. Menendez or Mrs. Menendez ever contact you regarding any of your suggestions in the comments? No, I never heard from them at all. And these comments again were sent out to parents. That's correct. Getting back for a moment to the, the copying incident where Eric copied the other child's paper, what, was that essentially copying the other paper word for word? Almost word for word, especially as one got closer to the end, except that then uh, he was going so fast, you could see he was under pressure from the handwriting, from the speed, and certain things were dropped out. Um, that there was no attempt to change the structure or the wording, which is why I say it was not a very sophisticated effort. Okay. Now, 
you indicated that, that Eric had certain learning disabilities uh, that you observed in class. What were your suggestions um, that you offered in terms of dealing with these learning disabilities? I suggested, uh, I commented on the, um, the uh, problem with the writing very early on. I talked about his working on study strategies both at the beginning of the year and the end of the year. It seemed to me that his uh, erratic performance showed very erratic kind of preparation, that he was not familiar with, uh, or at least not doing the kind of organization and mm -hmm. separating important things from minor things that you do as you prepare for a test or as you take notes in class. Uh, kids who have uh, problems with dysgraphia uh, often don't take very many notes because, again, the physical act of writing is so painful. Is there a procedure at Princeton Day School when a child does something like Eric did, copied another child's paper? Yes, it was a primary offense, and uh, he went before the judiciary. Okay, and uh, is that kind of like a committee of people that meet and decide what should happen? It's a committee <laughs> composed of elected members of the student body representing each grade and also has faculty members both permanent and rotating on it. And does uh, the child just come by himself to the Judiciary Committee or, or can, can there be a parent there? Uh, the advisor accompanies the child and the parent can go if the parent wishes. Okay, and uh, were you in fact present there at the Judiciary Committee when they met to, to discuss Eric's copying the other child's paper? I was present for the first part of the hearing because I was bringing the charge. All right. And was uh, Eric there? Eric was there. And was Eric's mother there? Eric's mother was there. Did uh, Eric's mother uh, make any statements to the committee about what her son had, do had done? After I had brought the charge, uh, she did make a statement. She said, you have to understand that we were moving, and Eric was very busy. Okay. And I, is there a particular reason why Mrs. Menendez's explanations to the Judiciary Committee uh, is something that, that you remember today? Okay. Um, Mrs. Menendez, is, uh, how many Judiciary Committee sessions or, or meetings had you participated in? I had been a member as a rotating faculty member for quite a few years and that particular year uh, with two other faculty members I was one of three heads. Uh, the head had died in the fall and but for this case of course I couldn't sit on it. Uh, I had seen a lot of parents and a lot of not a lot of serious okay, cases. You've answered the question. Okay. Okay. Your next question please. And, um, was there anything different about Mr. Mrs. Menendez's reaction as opposed to the other, the other parents? Objection yes. Objection sustained. The answer okay. stricken. Did Mrs. Menendez comment on the wrongfulness of what Eric had done? Not at all. She never said he did wrong. She never said he did wrong. Did it appear that she had any perception that this was wrong behavior on the part of her son? Objection calls for speculation on part of the witness. Sustained. At the time, uh, Mrs. Menendez appeared and said, you have to understand we were moving. Eric was busy. Was he there? Yes, he was. Okay. And uh, Eric remained silent, correct? Remained silent. May I just have a moment, Your Honor? <coughs> Sorry. <laughs> okay. Mrs. Dolphus, you indicated that, that you first confronted Eric about this behavior. Um, did Eric admit or acknowledge that he knew um, that what he had done was wrong? He was scared. He was terrified. He didn't discuss that. Okay. He didn't tell you what he was scared and terrified no. of? One last question, Mrs. Stolpes. <coughs> did you like Eric as a student in your class? I was very fond of Eric. Very fond of Eric. Thank you very much. I have nothing.
Ma'am, in regards to this incident you've just testified about, I believe you indicated that when you confronted Eric Menendez with what your suspicions were that he cried, is that correct? That's correct. Um, did you feel sorry for him when he cried? I felt compassion, yes. Um, in spite of the fact that you felt compassion, you still reported the incident, is that correct? Of course. Okay, wh why? I, why? Because uh, one always does. And, and wh why? Because it was a violation of the honor code. Are, are the students at Princeton Day School supposed to abide by the honor code? Yes. And are they supposed to be held responsible for their actions in violation of the honor code? Yes, they are. I believe that you've indicated in the records that you have in front of you that there are five separate um, notations that you made throughout. In this particular year. Yes, and that was the only year that you taught Aaron Men Menendez. That's correct? right. In the first three of those reports, it appears that the reports are favorable. Is that, uh, in the, in the first. Uh, are those reports favorable, the first three? I'm going to check the question favorable. Okay, would you consider those reports to be positive reports rather than negative reports? May I just say, the very first one was written probably less than six weeks into the school year when you do not know a student very well. Uh, it is not my style as a teacher to be negative about students whom I don't know very well, although I do try to identify a potential problem which I saw in his handwriting. The second comment was very positive. He'd had uh, a fine quarter. The third comment, I may be uh, out of whack on these, um, um, or perhaps it was for a second. Third comment was the one that he got a two. The second time he got a grade, he got a three, he got a two. And that was very strong. He had done good work on a test. He knew he was organized and prepared, and that was the one time he really came through like that. Now, the test that he um, did well on in reference to this, I think you said second quarter, was that a test that was taken in class? Yes, it was. Were all of the tests taken in class, or were any of them the kind where you can take them home? No, in those days they were taken in class. Okay. And so the third report was, was a positive report, correct? On the basis of five, yes. All right. And then... I think. And then in April, um, there were two reports after the third one. That's that right. There were two reports in the second semester. Okay. And one was in April and one was in June. In June. I believe that in, in the notes and also in your testimony, those reports coincided with the advent of the tennis season. The first of those two would have been at the very beginning of the tennis season. And it was probably two weeks after spring break. And you were aware, were you not, that um, Eric Menendez was very much involved in tennis at that age? Oh, yes. Did he play on the tennis team at the school? Yes. Mm -hmm. um, I believe you indicated the, uh, that he displayed clowning behavior in class. Was that um, behavior disruptive to the classroom in any way? He was not one to carry on if you said cut it out. Um, the incident um, that you've referred to in which he copied another student's paper, did that also occur um, after the April or after the onset of the last? It was probably at the beginning of May. Okay, so it was after the, the onset of tennis season as well. Mm -hmm. Is that yes? Yes, sorry. I'm sorry. Now, the five um, that notations that you have in regard to his studies in your Bible class, um, would it be normal for the, any of those to contain a reference to this incident that you've testified to with the copying? I referred to it, okay. but I alluded to it. Okay, so it's, it's, it's not very clear then. Well, it's very clear to me, and I think it was very clear to him and very clear to his parents. Okay, but not to just someone who doesn't, isn't familiar with the incident? Yes. Okay. So in the first three, or the, your first part of the contact with Eric Menendez, he did do good work, is that correct? He was up and down. But he was capable. He was capable of good work. There were certain things that got in the way. Thank you very much. Any redirect? Yes, sir. Mrs. Stoltz, what do you think uh, was the moral lesson uh, of 
Mrs. Menendez's statement to the Judiciary Committee in the presence of her son? There was no moral lesson at all. She wasn't a good example to her son? It calls for conclusion and is beyond scope. Objection sustained. I'm going to ask you to look at your comments, um, specifically your first one, which was in October of 1985. Okay, in that, and this was one that you said that you wrote early on in your contact with Eric and, and you were trying not That's to right. It's written in October and it's probably fairly early in October. Okay, and you also mentioned in that comment that the physical act of writing seemed to be a struggle for Eric. That's right. Okay, and that also that it may get in the way of his dealing on paper with material that he may understand intellectually. Correct. And this is also the comment in which you uh, you said that we, we need to address this before the year advances much further. That's right. right. Okay, and, and I believe you testified that there was no response to this. There was no response. We would have had parent conferences shortly thereafter, or we would have had them there before. I never was asked to have a conference. Okay. Now, the uh, second comment uh, that Mrs. Bazanich mentioned, that's dated November of 1985. Yes, it is. All right. And in that comment, you, you mentioned Eric's having charted an erratic course that fall. That's right. Okay. And uh, by the that, did you mean up, up and down? Up and down. He had, in the final weeks, according to my comment, <coughs> done better work. And so, therefore, I was pleased that things were moving up rather than down at that point. All right. And the third comment is in February of 1986? That would be at the end of the um, sec second semester. Okay, and in that comment... I'm not finding uh, it. Here it is. Here it is, okay. Um, you, did you uh, <coughs> mention uh, Eric's being uh, flustered and that interfering with his work? I did. He had done quite well during that particular quarter. He, uh, I know, scored, he, f he fell apart on the exam, which was too bad. It was not indicative of the kind of work he'd done during the quarter, but characteristic of his getting flustered for a big and event. And then, then there's another comment in, I believe, April of 1986. Correct. Uh, and this was the... Uh, comment in which you mentioned uh, the prospective pressure in the spring because of tennis. He was beginning to slide. I talk about his having seemed to have lost the commitment to excellence that he had before and warned him uh, to try to stay focused on academics even though there was a lot on his plate. Okay. And in hit the final comment in June of 1986, mm -hmm. um, you mentioned that it had been a difficult quarter for him. Is that the reference to the copying incident? Um, do you want me to read the sentence that refers to it? Yes. The act's outline proved to be a learning experience in unexpected ways, perhaps the most valuable one of the year, if you truly profit from it. And did that also comment, did that comment also again mention Eric getting flustered under pressure and misreading directions to his detriment? Yes, he had done very badly on the final exam. And one of the reasons was misreading the directions for a pretty straightforward question, which he should perfectly well have been able to answer. Did uh, Eric's mother in your contact with him, Mrs. Dolphus, seem to care about uh, his learning and his learning problems. Objection. speculation. Could I just answer about my contacts with her? Why don't you rephrase the question and then maybe you can, depending right. on what the question is. Okay. You, you met with Mrs. Menendez before the judiciary, correct? Yes. And uh, you also, um, at that time that you met with her before the judiciary, had it sent home a number of these comments with suggestions and uh, that's correct. Okay. And had you had any contact with her in addition to 
uh, the judiciary incident and the, the normal. Mrs. Menendez never asked me or commented on anything about Eric's academics. Okay. Uh, would it be correct to say that uh, sh she did not appear to be concerned about his academics based on her failure to contact you? Yeah. She never contacted you? She never contacted me. Overruled the answer will stand for you. Did you see Mrs. Menendez at tennis matches in connection with the school? Uh, only once, and that was an in-house kind of thing. That was probably before Eric was in the upper school, quite a bit before. All right. Thank you very much. I have nothing further. Anything else? Yeah, All right. Thank you. Let me step down. You're excused. Thank you. Your next witness? Sure. Barbara Zussman, C U S S M A N. Uh, is that Dr. Zussman? Doctor, yes. What what kind of a doctorate do you hold? It's an academic doctorate in EDD. And are you presently retired? Uh, from full time teaching, yes. Okay. Yeah. So you were a teacher in the past? Mm hmm <laughs> How long were you a teacher? Altogether about twenty eight years. All right. And uh, did you uh, teach for some time at Beverly Hills High School? Yes, I did. When did you teach at Beverly Hills High School? Uh, until three years ago, I taught there for eight years total. All right. And uh, what particular subject or subjects did you teach? English. And I'm going to uh, ask you to uh, remember back to 1988 to 1989. You were teaching at Beverly Hills High School then. Yes, I was. And did you teach a class in which uh, Eric Menendez was one of your students? Yes. What class was that? It was a 12th grade English class. And was this, uh, what type of a, a, an English class? Did it have a theme? Uh, yes, the uh, theme was, uh, the literature was uh, Shakespeare. Okay. And was this a, an elective class that the students would choose? Well, it was a required, required that they take English, but the uh, content of the literature was the elective part. Okay. And this was a class uh, of 12th graders, correct? Yes. yes. Uh, and it was a class that began in September of 1988 and ended in June of 1989? That's right. Uh, so the first time you remember meeting Eric Menendez was in your class in the fall of 1988. Yes. Did there come a time, uh, Mrs. Zussman, when you had a conference or a meeting uh, with Eric's parents? Um, the f I, I had two meetings. Uh, the, the first one with both parents, I believe it was right before the, the Christmas vacation. Okay. And um, was there something unusual about the timing of that meeting uh, that you had with uh, Eric's parents? Well, from a teacher's point of view, yes, because it was a Friday before a vacation, and teachers are not normally expected to stay for any reason on Friday, and certainly not before a Christmas <coughs> vacation. But the request had been made for the conference by, through the counselor, and I thought I might as well get it over with rather than have it hang over vacation. So I said, yes, I'd keep the appointment. Okay. And did you, in fact, have an appointment with uh, Eric's parents uh, in sometime in December? On, on that <coughs> Friday afternoon, whenever it was, yes. Okay. Yes. How long did the meeting last? I would say it was a, about an hour, as well as I can remember now. All right. Now, you said that both of the parents attended. Did, did one of them do uh, most of the talking? I would say all of the talking was Mr. Menendez. And can you tell us, Dr. Zussman, based on your contact with Mr. Menendez at that particular meeting, um, what, uh, for, for, first of all, what, what did they want to talk about? About how uh, Eric was doing in my class, okay. basically. <laughs> and was there also any discussion about uh, recommendations for college? Yes, I raised that because Eric had brought me uh, requests to um, write recommendations to colleges for him. And I pointed out that it was unusual to ask a 12th grade teacher to do that because I had only known him so few weeks that it was more the practice to ask an 11th grade teacher to do it. Okay. What, what were your impressions of Ho Jose Menendez based on the meeting that you had with him? 
I thought he um, had a very definite uh, sense of who he was. I, I thought he was very condescending. He didn't seem to have a very high opinion of teachers, especially women teachers. What, what made you feel that he didn't have a very high opinion of uh, uh, teachers in general and women teachers in particular? Just his um, general attitude. I, I couldn't say he said anything. It was just the, the manner in which he spoke to me. Uh, what about uh, Ms. Mr. Menendez's uh, attitude towards his son? Did he expe express any expectations of his son during this me meeting that you had with him? That he expected him to, uh, to do well, yes. Okay. And uh, did you uh, have any, well, were his expectations of his son, in your opinion, realistic? No. No, I, I don't think they were. Okay. Could you tell us about uh, Eric as a student? What type of student was he? Earlier in the year, I thought he was uh, suffering from a, a typical case of senioritis, um, which means that there are frequent absences and work isn't handed in very often or very well, which is common with um, many seniors. Uh, it was very difficult to get work completed in class from him. Uh, written assignments were rarely completed if they were to be completed in class. But uh, homework assignments, eventually, I would get from him. And the caliber of those assignments was much higher than anything he produced in class. Okay. And did uh, there appear to you to be some difficulty, some learning difficulty on Eric's part? It didn't occur to me until much later in the second semester that Eric had a reading problem. And, and I really only noticed it because it's typical of uh, seniors especially to be able to compensate and to cover up for reading difficulties. Uh, there are all kinds of techniques that kids use to do that. But because it was a Shakespeare class, we did a lot of oral work and quite a bit of it was sight reading. And, and Eric liked to take part because he enjoyed acting. And I noticed as he was reading that he was substituting words for what was actually in the text. Um, using the right beginning sounds, but making up another word uh, as he was reading, and uh, <coughs> that alerted me to the fact that he was having reading problems. Okay. Is there a particular name for the reading problem that you observed with Eric? Well, some people call it dyslexia. Would uh, the, the substitution of words that you observed occur um, for any words or just very difficult words or can you tell us? Oh, about diffi it? difficult words, words of several syllables. Okay. Now, I, I wouldn't say he was a completely handicapped student. He wasn't. He could function. But with, I, I would imagine that this reading problem would slow him down somewhat. Okay. Did uh, it appear that, that Eric had to um, struggle to, to get meaning from the printed page? Judge Culture's speculation. In, in the sense that it might be new material and unfamiliar material, but as I say, because of his experience and, and the fact that he was a capable young man in many ways, he probably could make a guess at the real meaning as he was reading, but it would slow him down a bit, I think. Okay. Now, Are students able to, students with reading problems such as Eric, able to compensate for those reading problems in certain ways? Oh, I think they do, very definitely. And, and in what ways would a student with Eric's reading problems compensate? Well, he, he, there are different ways. I, I think one of the ways Eric did it was by uh, not by not hiding himself. Many kids who have that problem would shrink back and not be noticed, whereas er Eric was anxious to participate. He liked reading aloud. He liked acting. And uh, th as I say, the fact that he would substitute words that might make sense or might make meaning uh, was one of the ways he did it. Okay. Did you ever have a discussion with either of Eric's parents about his difficulties with reading? 
Towards the end of the second semester, Mrs. Menendez asked for um, a conference, and she came by herself that time. And I raised this point. I said I had the feeling that Eric had reading problems, that I hadn't noticed it as noticeably, but towards the end of the year, it was, I, I felt strongly that there was a problem. And she said, oh yes, we know that. We had him tested when he was younger, and uh, we were told that Eric was dyslexic. And I said at the time, I wish you had said something when enrolling Eric in the school, we might have been able to help him. But I really don't think so, because if it isn't handled early, by 12th grade, mm -hmm. there's probably not much that a school could do anyway. Okay, in other words, this, this reading dyslexia is something that you need <coughs> intervention and remedial classes at a very early age. Yes, I would say so. Um, in what way, uh, based on the, the year that you had Eric in your English class, do you think that his father's expectations of him were unrealistic? I don't think Eric's interests were mainly academic. I, I think he uh, preferred, um, he liked acting, I, I think he liked uh, athletic activities. Uh, he did not enjoy writing, his written assignments were not well done. Um, I had occasion to talk to a tutor and I asked her if she wouldn't write stuff for Eric because I could see the difference between his home assignments and the stuff that he did for me in class because I couldn't help him if I didn't see his own work and she became somewhat angry with me and said I was trying to take her tutoring job away so I soft pedaled on that. What about uh, memorizing? Would Eric uh, use memorizing as, as a coping mechanism or a way to deal with this particular learning problem? I think um, this is one of the compensation things I think he did. We, uh, in his drama class, with which I had nothing to do, he was asked to memorize a Shakespearean um, soliloquy of some kind. And he asked me one day if I would hear him rehearse it, which I did. And he had chosen a very difficult soliloquy from Richard II, a very difficult one to understand and I think a difficult one for an actor to perform. And I asked him why he chose to memorize it, which he'd done quite well. Mm -hmm. And he said, because you told the class it was difficult. Okay. One last question. W was there a difference, Dr. Zussman, between um, Mrs. Menendez and how she appeared and carried herself during the first meeting that you had with her and her husband and the second meeting uh, that she alone attended? The first meeting, um, both parents were extremely well dressed, uh, Mr. Menendez particularly, but she looked uh, equally uh, well groomed. The uh, second meeting, she was not as well dressed, her hair was not as, she just didn't look the same person, but maybe because it was the summer and she was you know, more casual, but she did look more dowdy, if that's the right word to use the second time. Did she act in any different way? Did, did she act? She seemed depressed. Well, she didn't say anything really the first time. Uh, mm -hmm. She was very quiet, and, and she was very quiet and low-key. The second time she just said, I've come in to see how Eric has been doing. And when was the second meeting? The date I can't remember, but it must have been quite late in the semester, probably around May. That was in May of Eric's senior year? Of his senior year, yes. Oh. Hmm? That's May of 1989? Yes. Yeah. Thank you, Your Honor. I have nothing further at this time. Cross-examination. Thank you. Dr. Zussman, you uh, indicated that you actually spoke to a teeter, a, sorry, a tutor that Eric had? On the telephone, yes. On the telephone. How did you find out that he had this tutor? Mr. Menendez told me he did. And when did uh, you talk to Mr. Menendez about the tutor? At the time of our first interview. I, I mentioned my feeling that I could help Eric better if I were looking at his own work, not work that was done by a tutor. So he gave me the tutor's telephone number. Mr. Menendez did. So Mr. and Mrs. Menendez had tried to assist their son by getting a tutor for him. Objection calls for speculation before you. Sustained. You had indicated, ma'am, that 
uh, you thought that Eric Menendez had some um, problems. Problems reading, for example. Yes. Uh, this tutor that you talked to, what sorts of uh, things would the tutor uh, be involved with, with, with Eric Menendez? Objection calls for either hearsay or speculation. Objection sustained. This conversation that you had with the tutor, did you find out what areas were covered with Eric Menendez by the tutor? Objection hearsay. This has to do with the conversation elicited by Ms. Morrissey in her direct examination? Yes. Overall. You may answer me. Um, I mostly talked to her about the writing that she was helping him with, which I understood was what she was doing as far as English was concerned. Do you recall who the tutor was? No. And you asked the tutor not to uh, help Eric as it related to your class? No, no, I, I didn't ask her not to help him. I, I wanted her not to... It, it seemed to me that she was write, rewriting much of what he did, and I felt she should help him, but not write material for him, or I wouldn't know what he could do. Now, did you have occasion to examine the grades that uh, Eric Menendez had gotten from Calabasas High School? Yes, I did. Did he get good grades in English um, from Calabasas High School? So far as I remember, he did in ninth and 10th grade, but not in 11th. Was it your understanding that Eric Menendez was a new student at Beverly Hills High School? He was new in the 12th grade, yes. So he came for his 12th grade uh, year? Yes. And that was the first time you had ever taught Eric Menendez? Yes. And you taught him for that whole year? Yes. Now, there was a, a point at which you indicated that Eric Menendez wanted you to write a recommendation for him. He's applying to colleges. Yes. And did you write recommendations for him? I did write them, but I explained to uh, Mr. and Mrs. Menendez that they would have to be very general because I hadn't known him more than a few weeks when these recommendations were due, and, and I had to say that in the letters that I wrote. Now, Beverly Hills High School is a fairly prestigious high school, I take it. I think so. It, it uh, is highly regarded as a high school? I think so. Do you know how it's rated among other high schools in California? I'm not going to object to this as relevant. Overall. I, th I think it's rated very highly uh, compared with many other schools in the country. Do you recall which colleges you sent out the recommendations, or did you just write a, a letter to whom it may concern? I don't remember the colleges I wrote to. Mostly it, it involved filling in some forms and then attaching a general letter that I probably did, as was my custom, to whom it may concern, and just attach it, the same letter to each college. Did you learn that uh, Eric Menendez had been accepted to such schools as UC Berkeley and UCLA? No, I never knew where he was accepted. And you indicated that you had two meetings uh, with respect to Eric Menendez, the first meeting uh, being with both parents. Yes. And the parents had come in and they were interested in how Eric was doing in your class? Yes. And you had a meeting of about an hour, I think you indicated? Yes. Now, the second meeting uh, in the second semester was with only Mrs. Menendez? Yes. And she also wanted to know how Eric was doing at that time? Yes. Was, uh, was that a pleasant meeting for you? Do you recall? I, th I think it was uh, so neutral. I, I didn't feel positive or negative. It was just an in interview with a parent, and it was, it was fine. Now, you indicated that uh, Eric Menendez liked to act. Is that correct? That's the impression I got. Now, you indicated that he was taking a drama class that you knew of. Yes. Are you aware of any awards that Eric Menendez received at Beverly Hills High School for acting or Your from Honor, his drama? All right, the objection overruled. This is a cross examination. No, I know of not, nothing like that. Now, you did know, uh, based on what he told you, that he was, he was taking drama. Yes. In fact, uh, he gave you a performance of his. Is that correct? I think you said Richard II? Oh, the, the soliloquy that he rehearsed before me, he also um, presented to the class to, as a sort of rehearsal for doing it for drama. 
He, he gave this to the entire uh, English class of yours? Yeah, I asked him if he would, and he said uh, yes, because it was an extra chance to practice before he was graded by his drama teacher. And uh, the class was impressed because it was a play we'd studied, and he had taken the trouble to memorize this soliloquy. And how would you rate his performance? Uh, as uh, as done by a twelfth grade, uh, as done by a twelfth grader, it was quite good. As a piece of acting, it wasn't superb, but it was good for a twelfth grade senior. Thank you. I have nothing further this time. Any redirect? You may have more. Oh, yes. Not really. Uh, where we were doing group work, maybe he was, but I, I wasn't the kind of teacher that encouraged being sociable when you were supposed to be working. Well, one, one way. I'm sorry. Objection sustained. Answer is true. The uh, soliloquy uh, that uh, Mr. Kuriyama asked you about was one that Eric memorized. Yes, right? yes. Now let's go back to the first meeting uh, with uh, Mr. and Mrs. Menendez, the only meeting with Mr. and Mrs. Menendez. How would you uh, describe Mr. Menendez as uh, overbearing? It's slightly. I think condescending was more uh, the, the feeling I got. In the second meeting, uh, Mr. Kuriyama asked you if it was in the, uh, the second semester. It was actually in May. Well, that would be towards the end of the second semester, okay. yes. And May is just about the end of the school year, correct? That's as I remember it, yes, yes. And, and generally by May, the end of the school year, there's not much that, that can be done in terms of students' performance. Here. That's true. Rather late to have meetings. Um, well, it was interesting that the parents of uh, a senior would even bother to come. So the, the fact that she came twice, it wasn't late. I mean, it was it was interesting that she came. Anything else? All right. Thank you, Mr. Pound. You're excused. <laughs>